Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the second day of the European uh, Championships in Canoe Marathon. Uh, we are in Lake Bohin, in the Bohin uh, Valley in Slovenia. It's a wonderful surrounding, it's perfect conditions for, uh, for marathon canoeing uh, in this uh, fantastic um, area. Me, Stefan Gustafsson, and uh, my partner Ivan Lawler wish you very welcome to follow us uh, during this morning session. Ivan, what do we have uh, coming up now? Um, probably one of the most exciting races of the weekend for a number of reasons. It's the Junior Men's K1. Um, there's a lot of good guys out there, and there's a, a big lack of knowledge. They haven't raced before, so there's a lot of unpredictability in a race like this. A little bit too much testosterone, maybe a little bit more excitement than there should be in the races themselves. So it's the one race where you expect the unexpected, really. And many of these uh, athletes uh, are doing their first international marathon, isn't it? So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they don't know the form of the other guys. They don't know who they're racing. And it's, it's a fact-finding mission for them. There are a couple of guys in here from Great Britain team who raced last year in Oklahoma, did very well. I think they were the first two underage finishers. Ziggy Chamil, number five, and Magnus Gregory, number seven. I'm going to put them down for medals. Absolutely, and also uh, in this uh, 24 athlete uh, strong uh, starting line, we have uh, Magnus Iversen from uh, Norway. I saw him uh, in um, uh, races uh, early on this um, this season, and he is really, really strong. And he has some heritage as well. His father took uh, had a gold medal in the world championships on 10,000 meters in K4 back in 87 and also a bronze on 1,000 meters back then I think and his mother is uh, an Olympic champion so um, and he is uh, really strong I've seen him as said and um, we can expect a lot also from him especially um, I think he will be fast out from the start that is within seconds now absolutely and, and maybe number 17 Eric Petro his brother's already been junior world champion, and they're they're off, away from the start. Always massively stressful for the athletes. They've got to have a quick look left, right, see who's going fast, see who they want to move over to. But Magnus Gregory, lane seven, is slightly ahead of the pack, and straight onto his side, Ziggy Chamil. This is looking good for the Great Britain guys, but on the far side, up in the red boat. Could be Nikolai Winter, Denmark. Very hard to tell from here. But it is uh, Great Britain, uh, Magnus Gregory, that is taking the lead and forming the pack there. Um, the inner side pack and the, the group on the inner side. And on the far outside, it's uh, Denmark. <coughs> uh, that is uh, forming another, another group. Um, this is uh, kind of group racing, isn't it? It is. I mean, there's a lot of tactical awareness here. Physicality isn't the only key to this. You don't have to be the strongest, you don't have to be the fastest, but being the wisest is uh, always a big help. You've got two Spanish athletes there. They've grown up in a system of marathon racing. They'll know what they're doing. The two groups coming together now. That's Denmark have come across just ahead. But Magnus Gregory moving forward and being challenged possibly by Hungarian there. Again, it's hard to read numbers at this distance. We've only got the same picture you have. But guy in green there, red boat, is taking the lead. Magnus Gregory latched onto his side. And now Denmark taking the lead. And the boys will need to try and rearrange to find the most efficient wash they can find and staying out of trouble. But from the pictures we see, no major incidents. Spain was also there. Spain is one of the major uh, nations in marathon racing, isn't it so? Always. But typically their juniors aren't as successful as their seniors or, or under 23s. It seems like their learning process for the Spanish comes later on in their career. Maybe they're just not exposed to as much high quality racing, but they certainly come through later as seniors. The speed is quite high out here. We can see that uh, from uh, uh, the group are splitting up quite a bit. That comes from a, a little bit of insecurity, I think, always, Stefan. If you don't know the other athletes, you need to keep responding to their challenges. Yeah. 
often as seniors you know the other athletes well enough and you know whether a challenge is a bluff or whether it's worth to, mm. worth chasing mm. as juniors you have to cover everything and that that makes the race slightly harder in a way yeah we can see a lot of white shirts uh, out there it's um, uh, norway and denmark uh, use uh, the white uh, track suits uh, so they are there we can see the red and the, and yellow that is spain uh, also a little bit of white in the spanish uh, green uh, used to be hungary so uh, it, um, and then great britain with the uh, red and blue stripes over their their track suits so it seems like it's um, the both both the british guys are are uh, heading off now into um, and trying to achieve a good position for themselves to the first turn the first turn is 1750 meters from the start line uh, so they have time to form uh, appropriate groups until the first turn hopefully we'll get a shot as they go around the first turn there's constant change of leader there magnus gregory keeps trying for the front paddler in the green shirt also and in the red next to him they keep trading the lead and there's a lot of posture in it. It is, it is a testosterone type affair isn't it each one of them wants to show the other one how good they are and they they have to accept though that there's a cost for each one of those efforts that they do and the, the wiser ones will cover what they need to cover and hopefully still end up in the front group the ones that are a little bit insecure will cover and keep posturing way too much too early and they'll pay later on yeah we will see that happen of course a lot during this race um, and the next uh, category on the start line is lining up now and that is um, junior women's k2 yes um, junior women uh, raced uh, k1 yesterday and um, we'll see some of these athletes doing their second marathon in two days uh, here today uh, also here some very interesting uh, names on the start line of course probably most notable for Denmark Catherine Rask who really tore the field apart yesterday <coughs> excuse me but it's uh, Hungary there leading second up from the bottom it's Fritz and Gal it's Hungary and it's Spain as we are used to see them um, Hungary and Spain is the two great uh, nations of marathon paddling and now they are uh, heading off already from the start number um, 351 there is Spain uh, Einhoa Hidalgo and uh, Irati Osa from Spain uh, and uh, the Hungarian uh, couple uh, Annette Fritz and uh, Frusina Gal. What's really interesting is the Hungarian girls have totally different girls in their doubles to in the singles yesterday. They've got so many people to choose from that they don't need to double up and exactly. they've still got the quality to be at the front of both exactly. fields. Exactly. They, the, they have the numbers to have a fu full crew and yesterday hu Hungary won all the medals except K1 junior women that was won by Katrin uh, uh, Rask from Denmark. Who, uh, who's in here who, yes, obviously and exactly together with uh, Lena Langland and uh, they had a good result also last year in the world championships in Oklahoma in K2 so the men's shot now clearly settled down things are just a bit calmer than when we last saw them but still a big group of people there boat number 20 from Denmark Daniels Hansen 22, Shaba Adasi from Hungary. I'll get a few more numbers hopefully as they go around, or maybe if we're lucky we'll get a graphic up. But I think we're struggling with internet again today, which is a little bit disappointing. But everything will be recorded for you. So a little bit of a push on from Denmark there. And a bizarre change of direction from everyone. I, not sure exactly what happened there. I think Denmark uh, rather misjudged the direction of the course. Yeah, obviously they did. Yeah, and that's strange because they will have paddled around this course all week yes. since they've been here. Yes. So what that comes down to is just stress on the day. He, yeah. He's he's like a rabbit 
be, rabbit in a car headlight. He's just going in the direction he wants to go and hasn't really thought that might be either the wrong or the right direction. He's just going in a direction. And it's that sort of breakdown in your thought process that is very costly through a race like this. You need to keep your head cool uh, always in this kind of racing. It's not only strength, it's also tactics and strategy and you need to think all the way through. Even in the periods where it looks like nothing's happening in the groups, you're working through a lot of different scenarios all the time. You have to know that if a certain boat goes, you will cover. If they don't go, then maybe you're, it's your turn to go. There's so many different permutations and combinations, but all of that is based on what you're learning at every minute of the race, whether it's fast section, whether it's a slow section. Women's K2 there. Still a big group, two Hungarians, see Belgium on the left there in the red, yellow and black vests. Germans should be there, Julie Hark, who raced yesterday. In fact, both her and her partner, Pia Engelhardt, they were both in yesterday's K1 race. I think. With the junior races, maybe they're short enough that racing yesterday really isn't a negative in terms of energy consumption. There's always the psychological downturn after a big race for for anyone, whether you can pick yourself up from that. But uh, these girls won't be physically drained, maybe a little bit emotionally drained. So, as the girls head up to the uh, first turn, We should at least be able to have a, a long view of the men as they come back. A little bit of downtime now while all the races are up the other end. So we'll entertain you with some more Boheen facts probably, Stefan. I learned last night that Boheen, Bo being the Slovene word for God, this was actually the, a value that God made for himself at the end of his big job of creating the entire world obviously and just after he'd made it for himself and made it this beautiful because he was going to live here he found a small local population that he'd forgotten and he had to move them in instead there's no actual word of where he went after that but uh, he did save his own little valley for the people of uh, Boheen which was nice of him very nice and he saved it also for us and this is really wonderful conditions it's a beautiful area it's an Eden of Europe and the, it's recommended for everyone to at least once in lifetime visit this beautiful valley. We are at a height of 500 meters about um, and then uh, the peaks around us is up to 2000, 2500 meters. It's really beautiful, it's warm, the water is flat and it's excellent conditions for marathon racing. Okay, so a shot there of the Junior Women's K2 crossing across the top of the course very hard to see who's who with the camera shots but that looks like Denmark Denmark with uh, Catherine Rask uh, who was the winner yesterday in women K1 uh, after a very impressive race and she is uh, today racing together with uh, uh, Lina Eriksen Langelund and um, they were they had a bronze medal uh, actually last year in K2 junior women when they were first year juniors um, we are competing in two years as juniors uh, you must be under 18 18 or younger uh, to be junior in canoeing and these girls uh, here you have the result list uh, coming up in the, on the screen. We have um, three stations around the course uh, providing uh, intermediate uh, resu results. It really looks like Catherine Rask is, ta is taking the race apart there again. I mean, they've yeah. broken away with uh, the Germans, Hark and Engelhardt, who I said had raced yesterday as well. So three out, three out of those four in the leading two there, 
all raced yesterday and the others just they've well they've been blown out of the water really they're, they're not even close so Jule Hake the one of the German girls girls there in the K2 had a bronze medal yesterday as well so um, <coughs> they are now heading for more medals and back on screen now here we are with the junior men's Magnus Gregory just moving to the lead with about two and a half minutes maybe to the first portage again he's been held off so what you saw there Magnus Gregory moved to the lead with no real intention of taking the lead all he needed to do was rearrange the group so that he could be on the leading wash instead of where he was it's a great move makes his life a little bit easier Ziggy Chamil also doing really well he appears to be in the v-wash and the Great Britain guys are really very well organized on this how does that work uh, Ivan uh, this wash hanging stuff well the boats obviously make a wave as they go through the water just like a surfer then you can position yourself on that wave so that your boat is essentially going downhill and going downhill as everyone knows who rides a bike is a lot easier than going either on the flat or uphill if you can combine two waves or even three as Ziggy has in the back there so he's got a wave from not only the guys either side of the leader but from the leader himself he's got a combination of three waves and his life is three times as easy as it could be yeah and we used to call that the gold wash or as the Danes uh, used to say sm uh, smell hole it I used the, to refer the butter, the butter hole I used <laughs> to uh, well that's a yeah. <laughs> we won't talk too much about that but I uh, I used to refer to it as my wash Stefan it's, yeah uh, it was it truly was it's uh, it's something you you can you're, you're a little bit insecure there you're a little bit under pressure when the groups change as we saw here you have to move and you have to move quickly and uh, here, we, and, uh, here we'll see Magnus Gregory that's quite a significant thing there he tried to overtake yeah. boat 12 there Iverson from Norway and Iverson held him off Magnus has to learn from that now he either he either asserts his authority and does it again or he has to change his position Ziggy Chamil also held off on the other side and those boys now have to make some changes and there we go there we got someone just tried to push into a place that wasn't his boat uh, the red boat at the back there I can't see the number on him I think it's Nikolai Winter from Denmark he tried to push into a wash you wouldn't see this in a senior race that wasn't his he tried to squeeze into the the diamond wash from the back and may have had a collision and immediately he's pushed to the back of the group yes so uh, in the lead now is um yeah, it's shifting, oh. shifting all the time, shifting all the time. But uh, we do have um, uh, Jonathan Dagnes Hansen from Denmark, uh, now boat number 20. And we have Magnus Iversen, uh, just as expected. He's a very, very rapid uh, paddler and also have some tactical skills. I've seen that before. And then we have uh, from Belgium, uh, Arne Depres uh, with boat number two. Uh, and uh, in the red dress, uh, the Danish red dress, uh, boat number 727, uh, Nikolai Winter. So uh, Denmark is racing in two uh, track suits here. The, the leading guy there now from Denmark uh, is um, Jonathan uh, Dagnes Hansen. Uh, he is racing in a white uh, suit and uh, Nikolai Winter with number 727 in a red. And uh, we can all see them now. Uh, the British guys in their with their red and blue stripe over their their uh, suit, and uh, the Hungarians with the green back. So there they are, all of them. It's Denmark and it's uh, Hungary and it's Norway, and the guy at the far right hand side. Who is that? Have you seen that? I can't see the number on him, but he's he's just made quite a you know, a, a serious move up to the front there move Ziggy Shamil from Great Britain out to the right another position which isn't ideal for him and you can see them there just getting slight confusion you can see how it's shifting all the time and uh, the move of uh, the paddler that we don't know, know the name of yet uh, uh, made a significant change uh, into the group uh, the other paddlers need to keep keep them off uh, the guys that is coming from the side and trying to achieve a position for him for themselves that's uh, what it's all about and it's shifting all the time you need to keep the brain cool and uh, and make something uh, good out of it for yourself so it's a lot of tactics here 
At this stage of the race where there's so much change, there's so much confusion, your priority is to look after yourself. You need to get yourself in a position that's the most comfortable for you and then later when everything settles down, then you can start to rearrange the group to disadvantage other people. But at this stage where there's so much confusion, you need to just have one goal and that is to make your life as easy as possible. And it could also be helpful to be two uh, from from a team in a, from one nation in a group because you can can help each each other quite quite well. And you've got someone who you can predict their movements. You know them yeah. well. You've raced them at home, and you know what they're going to do in any given situation. So that that simplifies your life slightly. And that differs also junior racing from senior because seniors have uh, met uh, hundreds of times uh, on the races and they know the tr strengths and weaknesses of each other, uh, which helps uh, a lot to, to achieve a good position and, uh, and make the right tactical moves. While the juniors are newcomers, they don't have the tactical experience yet and they don't know each other. So. Uh, could be quite exciting racing uh, among the juniors and also exhausting for the paddlers there. You, you can see the speed varies so dramatically. They're just going, they're very slow now. Yes, very so slow. Nobody's confident enough to take it on, but nobody's slow enough to drop off or there's, there's everyone's able to stay in there. It's costing some people more than others, depending where you are in that group. But they're all there and the first portage is going to be of huge significance for that group. Meanwhile, just coming in, about a minute or so away from the first portage is the junior women's. Oh no, they don't do a first portage on the first lap, do they? What no. am I, Stefan, what am I talking about? <laughs> I, I worry myself sometimes with my own lack of insight. But they're just going around the first turn and very well organised, isn't it? Those two boats are clearly the two quality boats in the field. I mean, we have done so many races uh, and we didn't have that... Uh, that, that uh, first lap without portage, so talking from just uh, experience of our hearts it's easy to to say the wrong things here when this have changed i really appreciate you backing me up when i make my hideous <laughs> errors stefan it, it may, it's so much so comforting but yeah you've got to be disappointed if you're a hungarian team here haven't you you're not even with the other paddlers i mean you should be a nation that size in the paddling world should at least have someone who can sit on the wash of those first two so not a great day for them, but then they had such a great day yesterday. No one but them's going to be upset about it. Again, back to the junior K1 as the main picture. Again, it's flurries of activity, then a lot of dead time. And the flurries of activity are people just rearranging the group to suit themselves. They're trying to get a better position in the group. And then the real frustration then when you do get your better position in the group is that someone else then goes and changes it to a shape you don't like again. But uh, usually, in this sort of scenario, the main contenders are in the first three, and the group arranges around them. So if you consistently see paddlers in that first three, then they're usually the ones that are going to come good towards the end. So you've got Denmark, boat 20 there, Dagnus Hansen, he's been there throughout, Magnus Gregory also been there throughout. Ziggy Fine. Shamil and Iverson yes. look like the paddlers yes. to watch for me yes. at this stage. Absolutely. You never know. The Hungarians uh, are usually very good and uh, hide a little bit uh, in, into that group. You can see how easy it is for them at yes. that stage. But easy doesn't mean they're resting. Certainly mentally look, they're not resting. Yeah, he's having a look round. Not to see if he's getting away, but he just needs to check on the whereabouts of the people he knows are, da are dangerous to him. Ziggy now may let this Hungarian go past him to squeeze him back onto the V, but instead of that, the whole group's just died off again. No one wants to be the leader. No one wants to do the work for the other people. And that's a very tactical race and, and quite a, an educated race from the, from the youngsters. Last year it was uh, Matej Georgiakab from Hungary who won in, in a quite amazing race in Piestani where he went away quite alone at an early stage of, stage of the race and had a 40 seconds uh, uh, winning gap to uh, Magnus Gregory who had a silver medal already last year. 
And Magnus Gregory is still very young. He's still a junior next year as well. Okay. So, yeah, he's, he's one of the best prospects. Well, he, he probably is the best prospect in the UK at the moment. And in fact, <coughs> he's in the he's in the sprint team as well as probably all these juniors are there in the So he was just 16 marathon. last year when he, yeah. when he had uh, this yeah. uh, silver medal. That's uh, amazing. And he, he he and Ziggy have both made a massive decision to actually be here this weekend. They they were told at home if they didn't race at home this weekend at one of the national regattas that they won't be picked for the uh, junior sprint world championships. But they've chosen to do a sport they enjoy. They've chosen to make their own decisions and it's quite a big deal back at home but I really admire both guys for making the decision they have I think they've made the right decision and uh, it's great to see them here because without those two guys the field would be less of a lower quality anyway and then the higher the quality the, the more the entertainment so I really think they've done a great thing being here and applaud them for doing that it's a lot to um it's a lot to achieve uh, doing a marathon. It's uh, races all over the world and all kind of races. So these paddlers got um, a lot of experience and a lot of uh, a lot of good um, events actually all over the world in front of them. These youngsters uh, when they do marathon and except from that they also got very good training for all kind of, of canoeing in the years to come for them. Another paddler that uh, participated last year was Nikola Nikola Winter, Winter from Denmark. He's also here now with the boat number 7727, uh, and he was uh, eight last year in Piestani. He looks like he's stepped up since last year quite a lot. Then because he's yeah. very well in contention in this group. He's covering all the moves nicely. He's obviously learned a lot from last year as well, and. Uh, he looks like also one of the main contenders. Yeah, there's nothing to separate those guys at the moment. It will be significant when they get to the first portage to see really who's who's calm enough to do the first portage efficiently, and who uh, who's going to panic and do something. There will be someone I'm sure doing something slightly erratic. But uh, at the moment, the group's well organised on the water. Everyone appears to know what they're doing. Is Hungary in the lead there now? but it's shifting constantly. Sometimes in this stage of the race it's uh, quite easy to uh, be in front. Uh, it's also a way of tactics to stay out of uh, all the uh, trouble water behind the uh, first guys uh, just to in this excellent co uh, conditions. Uh, stay in front and go nice and easy and have no problems at all. I mean, leading leading a group obviously is like leading the, a cycle race, road race. So you you are in theory doing the most work of the group, but there is a calmness at the front mm. there that's quite relaxing. The other guys who are constantly circulating, each sprint they do costs something, mm. and there's only so many somethings you've got in you. And exactly. Once you run out of somethings then you're tired and things get quite hard for you. So but being at the front isn't the worst place to be. No. That was the tactics I, I, I loved uh, to stay in the front and just feel nice and easy. But you had an op opposite uh, tactics yeah, uh, it, it, often. You work to your strengths and you work to, to how your brain is happy as well. Yeah. Uh, I was very comforted if I was surrounded by people. That that meant I had spare op options always. You know, that if you're in that V wash at the front, there's always another wash behind that and another one behind that in the group this size. So there's always a safety net. If you're at the front, I was always convinced that everyone was working less hard than I was, and that really used to bother my mind. So I didn't want to be there. But for you, you enjoyed being at the front. Yeah. It, it was it suited your mentality and it suited your skill set. You know, I remember being on your wash just wishing you'd slow down and because it, it's it's hard when people are pressing on and it's a very brave thing to do to press on as well because you have to have enough confidence in the training you've done to know that your speed when you're going hard is actually damaging someone exactly and now uh, the girls is they are increasing the gap uh, continuously uh, to uh, the big pack and that is quite impressive what they are doing.
It's impressive, but disappointingly easy, I think. You know, it, it's already Spain, 50 seconds. Yeah, Spain, Hungary, they should be there, shouldn't they? Yeah. And you know, you've even got a Polish crew in sixth place there. And the Poles traditionally have very strong women's kayak. Yeah, and but it's, it's interesting that Germany has a good K2. I haven't seen that before. I think it's the first time, time actually. Uh, the German uh, marathon K2 in the junior category is uh, that way ahead. Yeah, I think you have to go right back to even 92, maybe, in the senior category with yeah. Ancha Manfroni and Annette Schuch, who won the race yes. in 92. Yes. Uh, since then, really, not much has happened. I think Annette Schuch um, won a medal with a, in a K2 somewhere else. I can't remember which year. but uh, She used to pedal uh, in the K4s and the K2s also with the famous uh, Birgit Fischer, Fischer generation um, in Germany. Absolutely. I think they were both from the old yeah. Eastern, yeah. Eastern German system. So here we are. Everyone looking very composed. I'm not enjoying seeing Magnus Gregory on the second washout. The second washout is not the favoured washout. That, that's, it's quite hard there. You are safe. You're on the outside of the group. No one can do you any damage. But you're just working that little bit too hard. It's a little bit too long there. Yeah. Uh, that really bothers me. <laughs> Here we go. Maybe so this is uh, a change. Yeah. And he's pushing on now and he's forcing uh, Ivar Sen to, to uh, make a move as, as well. And as you can see now, the group is uh, reforming quite rapidly. And this is the run in. They've got about a minute to go now to the portage. And these boys, their brains will be working hard now. Absolutely. They're trying to plan where they're going to go. They've got to make judgment on where their opponents are going to go. You can't come into this landing stage and then wonder what you're going to do. This will be very, very decisive, this first portage. And uh, Hungary is making a move now. It's um, <coughs> number 22, uh, Bespalo, Dim Dimitri Bespalo, who is taking the lead in. And it is um, also, of course, uh, Torbjörn Jonathan Dagnes Hansen from Denmark and it's Ivar Sen and now they are at the Portis all of them and jumping out of the boat quickly 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 and we will so soon have the the result list up here and uh, over the Portis now fast running So that's a learning curve right there. Ziggy Chamil's done incredibly well. He's come out of that brilliantly. Very calm. On the flip side, Magnus Gregory's had a bit of a nightmare here. He's going to have to do a lot of catching up. Bad oh. getting into your boat. Too, too stylish. Too much fanciness. And just keep it simple. You nearly filled his boat up with water there. And that would have been end of for him. Yes. Ziggy Chamil away first. Very happy with that from a Great Britain point of view. I would like to see where Magnus Gregory is. So what, what did we learn from that? The boys should have learned that the Hungarian, number 22, he's fast. He's very fast. He came from the back of the group to the front of the group coming into that portage. They should have seen that. They should make note of that. Denmark in the uh, red and white boat. I, I haven't got his name to hand. Very good getting in and out. Well, <laughs> not getting off at that end, but he was very quick getting out the portage. And Ziggy Chamil, obviously very well organised to come out first. Ziggy Chamil has a lot of experience. We have seen him around uh, several times already, as young as he is. Yes, and we could see that. It's a lot of technique and also a lot of experience. You need to stay cool, not do any fancy things, just the things you're safe with. In the lead up to that portage, for me, Magnus Gregory, who's one of the main contenders here, he sat on the outside of the group and not leading. So you have last pick of where you can get in to the portage. If someone goes long and you were deciding to go long, you have to wait. It's a big mistake and one that he's, he's going to cost him. So next time we get a camera shot, we'll see what damage was done to that front group. At the moment, we've got a vision of a tree. Okay, Slovakian athlete just paddling away from the pontoon, one of the back end paddlers. It's not going to make much of an impact on the race. We can't actually see much from here at all. Next thing we can see 
from the from the commentator's tent that you can't see online is that the uh, women's K2 are maybe three or four minutes from the portage. But at the moment, we're watching the tail end of the portage. People having water thrown at them. And it would be great if we could get a shot of the sharp end of the race here. So there you see someone who put his boat inside the paddler in front of him and had to paddle backwards to get out from the landing stage. As we were speaking yesterday, if you get into a pontoon behind someone, you put the boat on the outside of them, not on the inside, so that you can move away whatever they're doing. So we're still waiting to catch up with the front end of this race. It would be great if we could do that. Please, Mr. Cameraman. views of the portage spectators a good number of spectators here at this event it's a it's got a good atmosphere on site we've got a local commentator who actually never stops speaking for, for an entire day I don't think he even stops speaking at night he, spe he speaks in his sleep and uh, apparently he's single and he is accompanied by uh, Jim Rossiter, who try to get in, into it uh, at least sometimes when he catch his breath, this local yep. guy. But it's not... Uh, I, think, I think Jim's slowly losing the will to live on that. He's, uh, he's actually right now, as we look at him, he's standing on the edge of the lake, looking like he might jump in and end it all. <laughs> it's hard for him. So in come know. the women's K2, about a minute away from the first portage. This won't be the chaos of the men's. It's one either side of the portage. The Germans are going to come to the right. Danes left. And there you go in shot there. They're just separated now to come to the portage. And this will be a lot calmer than we've just seen from the men's. I really want to get to see the front of the men's to see who made it back to the front of that group. Um, apparently we can't get the screen graphics on the men's. The system's down with the internet. But... Uh, I promise, as soon as we get some, either a visual from the tent or from the cameras, a meaningful vision, then we will re-inform you. So these two crews, very much out on their own. Germans a little slow getting up and running. Danes look a bit sharper. You have to favour the Danes probably. So this side we've got Denmark, the white boat, Germany and the second second group just coming into the portage now, group of four being led by Hungary, two Hungarians, Polish and Belgium. All four deciding to go to the same side of the pontoon and there's your ensuing chaos never pick the back of the boat up before the front the back person must not touch that boat until the front person's lifted it as a front paddler in a k2 my worst nightmare is when the back person picks up the boat before i do then i have no control over direction i have nothing i have to pick a boat up that's full of water and back people need to be educated to just stand back when you get into a portage like that stand back wait for the front person to lift the front and then they can join in when i'm ready as the front person it's a lot of coordination, a lot of training that is needed. So 43 second gap there. That gap won't be closed. But that fight for third will be quite entertaining as the race presses on. So Poland, Hungary, and here we are back to the front of the Junior men's race. Can't quite see who's who. See Ziggy Chamil. Second washout. On the inside here, you can just see the bow of his boat. Leading. Looks to be number 23. That's Vold from Norway. 727. Nikolai Winter from Denmark. Number 7. Magnus Gregory, thankfully made it back to that group. 
but at a cost. There's always a cost. So 23 there. Sorry, 23. Yep. Yeah. Jon Vold from Norway. Everyone's back. But some people have just had quite a lot of resting and others have had quite a lot of work to do. It's interesting. Uh, this um, Jon Armand Vold from, uh, from Norway. Norway, his brother won actually. Uh, if it was, I think it was the World Championships uh, back in uh, Singapore or something like that. Um, okay. As a junior, Avin Vold from Norway. Did they? The Norwegians won the K2 in Singapore as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. A good weekend for the Norwegians there. Yeah, I think it was and that. A bit of significant happening there. Somebody, <laughs> somebody has either fallen off the group and moved wide to get back to the group, or he's trying some sort of solo fanciness. It's hard to tell the depth of vision there as to where he is in relation to the group. All we know is he's not quite attached. The shot of the tail end is moving up to the top portage. Top turn rather, top portage, what am I talking about? But the main race is up with those eight or nine guys in the front group. Hopefully some of them will have learned from that first portage, will correct their mistakes for the second one. So I think watching that front group there, Stefan, coming into the portage and you see them mixing the group around, really that shows you that, that marathon racing isn't racing for slow people who are just endurance-based animals. That marathon racing the, the high speeds in marathon racing will be equally as high as the high speeds in most of the sprint racing. It, Absolutely. The, the speed, the turn of speed, and definitely the acceleration you need. Acceleration is key when you're moving around a group like that. Is just as much as you do for any any sprint race. Mm. And uh, and we have seen uh, that happen in some other races. Uh, I re remember back in Copenhagen in 1990, we had a speed that was only Two, or two seconds or so slower than uh, the normal winning time on 1,000 meters, the first five k kilometers. Wow. So one of the fastest uh, first five k's ever. And sometimes that happens. So it's a lot of sprint skills as well in, in marathon. And the, the variation is huge because yes. you can actually be traveling at probably six minute 1,000 meter pace yes. some of the time or even slower. Yes. Yes. And there are, there are conditions where actually everyone stops. Yes. Yes. Which, which is quite a bizarre situation. You're trying to cover 30k, mm. and everyone stopped. You can see that in all all this kind of. It's the same in cross country skiing with, with the mass starts. Uh, some sometimes it uh, is really slow, and some some of uh, the athletes are master of that game, as you were, um, and um, uh, some others really want a high speed all the time. And that's. For what makes it interesting, and it, and each race unique. Yes, and you have to work to the field you're you're competing against. You have to work to the conditions you've got. Obviously, a race on a, a lake that's this wide is very different to on a river that's quite narrow. You, you can't you can move to the side to catch up here. And there you go. The, there's a shot of the front group, and they've virtually stopped. That, all, that all stopping, world. that stopping, really shows a lot of respect among the athletes. No, yeah. no one, no one is sure that they're better than the other athletes. Mm. No one's confident that they are the king of that group. There's a lot of, not insecurity, but there's a lot of mutual respect, and there's a lot of uh, just jostling for positions and seeing, seeing a bit of testing. Another but thing that is so. Oh, I saw that. You saw that. He's throwing his drinks bag in the water. Denmark commentator's penalty point. That is actually not allowed. Um, throwing drinking bags uh, into the water. The, the drinking bags they are carrying their drinks in is uh, plastic bags hanging hanging around their necks. Uh, so uh, we don't want that, them into the water for environmental reasons. Back to the women's K2 situation. Normal sharing the lead. I would imagine, I mean it's hard to tell they're sharing it from that shot, but 
I imagine at this stage they're just sharing the lead they'll keep their comfortable distance on the uh, following pack and their race to decide who's going to come first or second will probably begin at the final portage yes in the meantime for them it's just a journey now and they will do uh, five full laps and the four portages and after the uh, last portage they do a 500 meter short lap uh, into the in sprint these junior women so in this junior women you see both the big teams the hungarians and the spanish the teams with numbers mm. back home they're being beaten here and that's not unusual we've had small teams in the past the dutch team were the classic really mm. they had some good guys for a long time and it's just a situation you can grow quite a small club or, or group in a nation that, that are progressive and want to move forward and you can do it in a small group you're not that disadvantaged if you haven't got a mass of people it can uh, be done absolutely absolutely Denmark is a proof of that and also Sweden during a period that had the, the top athletes both on the female and men's side with uh, only with only uh, six or eight athletes totally uh, yeah. in the team yeah and to an extent the guys from Great Britain here they're, they're from two clubs in in the UK both clubs are really well motivated at the moment we just talk about the group for a while you see a massive flurry of activity always significant who wins this as the two Danish athletes move to the front and now they're at the front actually neither of them wanted to lead they just wanted to establish a change of position yeah. But that was quite costly. It was a it, hard move he did. It was a hard move. Magnus Gregory moving around the outside. He doesn't want to be stuck at the back. But and this, this is a very good example of team racing as well. Uh, we could see that Nikolai Winter, uh, the Dane, really made uh, this move to establish a good position, a secured position for his teammate uh, in the red and white boat there, uh, Jonathan it looks Hansen. very much to me like Magnus has learnt from his previous mistake. I mean, he's just moved to the front there. They're about two minutes from the second portage. Yeah. And I think he he's regretting what happened to him at that first portage. And wise enough to say, you know what? That is not happening to me again. Exactly. Now, I think dropping off the back of that group is the Hungarian that we rated. He's the one who came into the first portage yeah. first last time. He's, he doesn't seem to be in touch with the group anymore. So, although he had a fantastic sprint into that portage, it seems that he's the one that, uh, strangely, hasn't been able to keep up with the group. But that's uh, only a visual, and that's a long-distance visual, so maybe I'm wrong on that. But at the moment, it's... No, Magnus you're quite right. It's uh, Denmark, and it's Norway, and it's uh, Great Britain in the top uh, top group now. Yeah. So, uh, Magnus Hungary Gregory leading in. Yes. Hungary has dropped off a bit. It's definitely so. Both Danes, both Norwegian, both uh, British guys, Norway. Very encouraged by that last move. Ziggy and Magnus both up the front. And this looks so much better. I'm so much happier watching this coming into the port than the last one. Both our guys, beautifully well organized. Everything's under control, finally, for them. And they will come out of this. And I think this group's going to split into a front group of four after this portage. There's a lot of people not looking particularly comfortable anymore. So if our boys can get out, run well. We know the red and white boat of Denmark gets out well. He ran well at the previous portage. These two, these two at the back here could be that's Iverson there was that yes that it was Iverson? yeah and uh, Eric Petro the second Hungarian number 17 so it's one Hungarian still within the top group <coughs> our boys Great Britain boys here they can split this to a group of four now I think if they're prepared to press on they I don't know what they feel about the other athletes but they're in a position now where this group could go down to four a wonderful portage show the British guys there. There's the four. Two Danes, two Great Britain. It's significant that there's two teams, if yeah, you like, teams. in there. Yeah, two teams, exactly. So if they can communicate now amongst themselves, this could be 
down to four athletes. Uh, watch this now. It's uh, Magnus Gregory who is uh, keeping the speed. and um, They are now heading to uh, to form a diamond out of four paddlers and keeping the others the, the others off. If they can do that, they can help each other in a very, very comfortable way. A very decisive portage, this. Really, Nikolai Winter should be dropping and coming up behind. Yes. Yeah, he's working too hard on the second wash. He needs to get tucked in behind Magnus Gregory and that will also give his countrymen a better target to aim for yeah. to get himself comfortable so although you'd expect a bit of team tactics maybe uh, Nikolai Winter is a bit more stressed than we think and isn't necessarily in control of what he's going to do mm -hmm. next maybe he's being dictated to by the two Great Britain athletes maybe he has not experience enough to do that but he should definitely press on there now Okay, Ziggy's leading yeah. now. Yeah. This will fall into the exactly. Danish hands. The group will form Perfect. and we're done. Perfect really. for Denmark, yeah. Denmark, that. They are talking to each other, obviously, there now. We can see that from the move of the, the, their heads. In the second group there, the two Norwegians, one Hungarian. Yeah. And none of those three look like they're pressing on no. to, to close that gap. Not too hard. No. Staying calm and uh, conf confidently they are confident uh, to themselves and now that they will uh, close the gap over the distance oh, I'm going to disagree I think I don't think they're going to close that gap they you need, don't think so they need to move wide maybe they can run down the washes yeah. a little but the front group with two teams in it they know that there's a safety in that group of four they should they should but we're seeing that happen many times so uh, So Dane's now taking the lead and they're just going to be sharing that lead among the four of them. In the, the best thing to do for the four at this stage would be to do two or three hard leads each, knowing that they get the rest as the group rotates. They'll rotate that group, get a big enough gap on the second group to be safe and then start racing among themselves. But the four of them, if they work together now, they can create the gap that's too much for the others to, to leapfrog. So fingers crossed they'll do that. What do you think about Hungary there? All alone. Do you know there's there's no way back for Hungary there all alone. He all he's what he had going for him was his turn of speed. He came into that first portage and he was fast. And he's obviously used that speed too often. He's maybe changed in the group shape too often. He's now got nothing left. And a turn of speed that lasts ten seconds is not going to close a gap that's twenty seconds long. For that you need a good steady grind. He's pressing on there. He's pressing yeah. on quite well, and he's using uh, the side wash there. Uh, he's trying trying that to reach. Uh, but ev even if he closes that gap, and then he closes the next gap, that's not going to put any fear into the hearts of the no. leading group, because no. they know he'll be shattered. They know that it's not going to work. The women's K2 now coming round the portage, round the, oh, round the turn, rather, before the portage. And... And there is a penalty uh, on the Spanish boat. The penalty is uh, if, if you do something wrong out there uh, at the course, miss, missing a turning boy or doing anything, anything else wrong. Uh, there is uh, judge, uh, judges uh, along the course uh, seeing that. And then you got a penalty. So uh, in the, the penalty, Getting a penalty means that uh, you need to stop at the portage, wait for a couple of seconds until you can race again. And these girls, um, 351 uh, Spain, have got the 15 second penalty. So uh, they are in the second group and they need to stop and wait for 15 seconds. Uh, very frust frustrating standing there just waiting uh, before they can continue the race. Can you imagine how long that 15 seconds feels oh, if yeah. you're those oh. paddlers? That, that 15 seconds is going to feel like two minutes yeah. while you stand there and wait. Those seconds will count down very, very slowly. And that is new. Uh, before we created this penalty system, it was only disqualification that uh, uh, we could use if anyone did something wrong. And that was not a good system. It's much more exciting to having them standing there waiting. 
I'm sure they won't be as excited as we will be. No. <laughs> but it's better also but, for yeah, them. Yeah, it is okay. better for them. At least they're still in the race. Yes. You saw the Germans and the Danes come into the portage there. Again, bit of a exhibition of portaging. The Danes, front of the boat out first. The Germans, back of the boat out first. And there's the two ways of doing it there. The right way and the wrong way. Luckily, they're in no, in no hurry. So, again, the Germans put the front of their boat in first. They should put the back in first here. So, these are basics. These girls should know this stuff. Your athletes, if you're listening, you're a coach or you're a paddler, it's, portaging is very simple. The front of the boat comes out the water first and the back of the boat goes in the water first. These girls still pressing on. They're not going slow, are they, Stefan? No, no. They are pressing on quite well. And it's interesting. Denmark uh, seems always to have a very good uh, K2 women. Right through to seniors. They're the only team that have challenged the, uh, Hungarians. the Hungarians yeah. for gold yes. in the last few years at yeah. world championship level. And that, that tradition goes back for 20 years or yeah. so. Absolutely. Although, having said that, Stefan, I've got to step, step up for the Great Britain girls who are European champions from last year. Yeah. And they, they will be racing here again this year. And in the senior women, they're definitely one of the boats to watch. Absolutely. But traditionally, yeah, it's only really the Danish girls who can match. Why is that, do you think? I don't know. I mean, we've we've matched them a couple of times from Great Britain. Anna Hemmings and Helen Gilby won the World Championships back in Stockton. Um, we've had the crew that we've got now can also match them. But I don't know. Denmark have a traditionally strong women's team. Back to the Knudsen sisters for in the sprinting. And they also raced marathon, didn't they? Back um, One of the two Knudsen sisters. Um, I don't know. Do you just have a women's tradition where you have an acceptance that you will be good mm. is it do you perform to expectation almost it's you're in a race you know that you should be there exactly they, it's natural for them to to be uh, to have a top crew crew there it's nothing unusual it's no big thing uh, and bizarrely the rest of the the field also works to your expectation yes. when 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 i was racing even if i didn't have a good day everyone expects you to be there so they accept you being there they don't pick on you because you're weak that day. They, there's still an acceptance that I belong there. And often that plays into your hands. So if the other girls expect them to be there, then they're allowed to be there. And the, yeah. it's almost self-fulfilling, the whole the result. So there's the graphic of how the women's K2 is panning out. I don't think that includes the penalty for uh, vote 351 on there, although they are down in ninth place. Now, I'm not sure where that graphic was taken from, but. Uh, from there. Oh, from the entrance to the portage. Yes. So they've got 15 seconds of penalty on top of being in ninth place. Mm. Uh, they won't be the two most cheerful girls at the party this evening. <laughs> So a bit of downtime again, while all the paddlers are up the top end of the lake. We were discussing a couple of days ago, Stefan, that you know, these junior athletes, they're great. They do, they're good at what they're doing, they're paddling fast, but it's very rare for a junior world champion to move up and become senior world champion. In fact, the, the, only, the only person that I can find that's done that was Ben Brown. And you know, what stops the guys moving into senior and just becoming competitive? It's 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 almost a mystery. It's almost a magical aspect of moving up through the through the classes. It's very tough on the good juniors to come through and become a good senior. It is. We have uh, the South Africans there, the Van der Waal brothers. Uh, they are also they have also done that, but then not for a gold yeah. medal. Yeah. Uh, not yet for a gold medal at least. Yeah. And today, this afternoon, I think we have Balas Havas yes. racing in the senior men's. Now, he came third as a junior in the junior worlds, mm. and he also won the under-23 worlds last yeah. year. But he won the under-23 worlds as a solo effort. He went away from yes. the group. So we, we don't know that Balas Havas can mix it in a busy group like these juniors are mixing it in today. And I, I'm going to say maybe that it's open to debate. He can't, you can't just move up from being the winning under-23 and join in with people as experienced as those Spanish paddlers, Ivan Alonso, Emilio Merchan, those people don't suffer fools. Mm. They're going to 
they're going to give Havas a working over on their terms this Absolutely. afternoon. Absolutely. And on the female side, we have uh, Vanda Kisli from Hungary, who uh, who won uh, already in, back in 2011 in Singapore um, and, and uh, in K2, and now is uh, a top athlete in, in, in under 23. But when we'll see how sh she managed when she got to the senior category. Is she racing senior this weekend, do you know? or We'll have a look, I we'll don't check think up so. on that for you later. I don't uh, think so. Maybe I'm able to check on the start yeah. line. On here. So we'll get back to you. Renata Zay is obviously their prime candidate yes. for, for gold. I mean, she's hard to beat. And no, it's, it's uh, Naomi Misko, yeah. who's their second yeah. K1. So they've got two seniors there who are clearly... They, they rate higher than this um, Banda Kisley. Banda Kisley. And it's hard to break in then for an athlete. It is. Especially in Hungary. Hungary has so many very good athletes. To be fair, Kisley's best option is that Renato say retires after the end of this yeah. year. That's the easiest way into the team for, for a newbie. I don't think she will. <laughs> she will keep on. <laughs> She'll just keep on keeping on. And why not when you're winning? Yeah. I mean, she wins on a regular basis. Yeah. And we'll be able to talk a lot more about Renata Zay this afternoon. Their race is 11.30 today. This morning then? Yeah. I really need to check on my facts before <laughs> I speak to the to, to Morning the world. or afternoon. So, a nice view of the junior boys still rotating that group well. Still four. And it is, this is uh, cooperation. How does it work, the cooperation in such a diamond? We used to call it diamond when they formed uh, this group of four. Uh, at this stage of the race, everyone has a responsibility to each other, not just to themselves. So this group is away from the following group. Whoever's leading will lead. The, the guys on their wash will decide if that speed's fast enough or not. If it's not fast enough, one will move up and take the lead. Or they'll shout at the guy who's leading and say, you know, come on you can't do nothing everyone else is doing their share this is a, a scenario where people are doing their share up to a point nobody wants to destroy themselves but they need to stay away from the following group but looking at it you can't see on your shot but from the commentary tent we can see it the gap between that front group and the second group is big now it's a, it's a minute maybe and they're safe at the front so sooner or later that front group will start deciding who's going to win rather than who's going to just cover the distance mm. And then the speed, in that stage, the speed will decrease somewhat. So what they are doing now is establish a gap big enough to to be able to do exactly that. They're basically creating room to play with later. Yes, yes. So they're about two minutes now from their third portage. A lot less stress on this portage now. It's not the final portage. There's only a few of them. There's, uh, there's a lot more relaxation in the in the minds there than there was. And no one has a real big interest to um, break up this uh, group at this early stage. No. It's quite comfortable and they share the work in front and uh, to sit on the wash uh, is uh, comfortable and to sit on the middle wash there but in between the wash hanging two on each side of the leading guy is really comfortable. Ideally, in a group like that, your mindset, if you are if you want to rest, you need to arrange that group so that you're in the diamond wash when the guy who's, who's the fastest leader is leading. You, that's the biggest benefit you can get. One of those guys will always lead faster than the others. Yeah. And when he's leading, you have to arrange that group so you're all the one on the diamond, not on the side. So you get maximum rest. The other two guys either side are working a little bit harder than you, and it all adds up to money in the bank for later on. That is uh, the mastery of the game. And you were such a master. A long time ago, sadly, Stefan. Yeah, yeah. A long time ago. So it's not just a it's not just an automatic circulation pattern. First, you need to get that circulation to suit you, and then it, make it automatic after that. But these boys look all very comfortable. And as you can see, no one is taking any big uh, initiative into this portage. This will be nice and comfortable. Magnus Gregory moving out to the left side along with uh, Nikolai Winter coming to the right. The other two guys, Ziggy Chamil and uh, Daniels Hansen. 
But this is going to be very calm, very relaxed. Nobody wants to make a mistake. Their only motivation here is to, to leave with the group. Nobody wants to get ahead. So they're up the pontoon. Now you get a shot of them running across the grass. And it's still about another 30 seconds or so until the second group arrive at that portage. Nice opportunity for drink changes because there's no rush. And then they'll make their way down. Hopefully keep it safe. Front guy puts his boat in. The others behind them have a little look round, assess what's happening. And if you don't like your position in the group, if you, if you want to change the group here, it's quite handy to be last out of that portage so that you know that you're going to get the diamond afterwards. Okay, if you, if you need a rest, then coming out of that portage last is quite a benefit to you. The group will form and you slot straight into the diamond and that kind of forces your position. Ziggy Chamil lead in there, having a little look round. Probably just to see how far the second group are behind. And also looking for his teammate, I think. Yep. See, see that everything is okay with him. Otherwise he could slow down a bit and, and create something good for him. So Ziggy Chamil there, he trains with sort of multi-discipline group up at Nottingham and uh, uh, coach Norman Mason who was one of our international athletes probably a thousand years ago now I'm sure Norman won't mind me saying that so they train with the norm plan group they call it a little bit of a breakaway a little bit of a renegade group but guys from Whitewater the downriver stuff sprint athletes um, Hayley Mason that's Norman's daughter and that is a really good motivational group they're really you can see they're cheerful you can see they're happy they're working well and it's obviously working well for Ziggy these three guys coming into the portage now, they uh, are, uh, they could uh, take it easy now and uh, help each other. They don't, they uh, lose, they use a lot of energy to uh, a totally unnecessary move into the portage. Interesting, you've got both Spanish athletes there. Yes. And they're, they're not working that well together. You'd expect them to be further up the field. But as I say, Spanish juniors aren't always, you know, what is this, what's he waiting for? He missed something there, I yeah. don't know. So, in, in a structure where they do so much marathon racing, you you would hope that they'd have better juniors, but traditionally their juniors are not up the sharp end. It's Nico Pofler from from uh, Germany, who is leading that group. And he's probably doing his first uh, international marathon race. I haven't seen him around before. Not uh, Nico Pofler, but we had his brother yesterday racing uh, I think it was in the under 23. So the Spaniard there just slipped off the end of the pontoon as well. He's just having a nightmare. These are yeah. just why? Why are you making a mistake like that? The, you can see a pontoon. Don't walk off the end of it. Mm. But that's how the brain functions. Once it gets tired, once you're in a hurry, you're trying to keep up. You don't make all the right decisions all the time, and each time you make a bad decision, it's costly. But it comes with experience as well and training. Yep. Uh, I mean, the top uh, top uh, teams are training this uh, these groups and together K1 and K2 and they are uh, just practicing uh, tactics and all the right moves. But that's so often what separates the front group from the second group. When you come into a chaotic portage, the ones that do it right move on to the front group, the ones that do it wrong move back. Experience and strength. Equally, I mean, you, you, you get the impression it's all on the portage, but a lot of it depends on how stressed you were in the lead up to the portage. If you arrive at the portage tired, your decision making capability is reduced. If you're comfortable in a group and you're in control of a group, then you've still got that energy reserve to make the right decision. Yeah. So almost any, any, any fatigue that's out on the water is magnified when you come to a stressful situation like a portage. And as you know, that uh, the final portage and the first portage is the most uh, decisive in in, uh, in the races. Uh, it's possible to train that actually, to uh, practice, to be totally exhausted and filled with lac lactic acid into the first portage, and make the right move. If you got that into into the genes of of, yeah. <laughs> of yourself, it's possible to always do do the right moves. And it's possible pr to practice actually. We did that in the Swedish team when we were 
top of the world back then. A lot of such practices. Also doing portraits after long, long, long sessions to practice the final, final ones. Right, just to uh, get used to taking the right initiatives. Yeah. And it paid off because you always did very well on the portages. You're yes. always someone we didn't want to let get away on the portages exactly. because you had that capability. And into the portages now, uh, out of the camera, is um, uh, the coming generation of the Swedish marathon paddlers, uh, Alexander Öström. Around the 15th position or so. Got a couple of K1s tagging on to those K2s there. Probably not the best place to do that right in front of all the judges and the entire spectator <laughs> to base, seeing as it's not really allowed. No, it's not allowed to wash hang on the on another category. It's not easy to to get away anyway the course is as it is and these guys don't want to pedal a longer distance so yeah they've dropped off now haven't yeah. they maybe maybe that's just bad timing yeah on there the k2 is coming in still well organized dane's choosing to go to the left of the pontoons and hold the germans out wide it's quite a clever move the germans need to be making a decision there. Are they going to drop back quickly now, which, or are they going to go run paddle past them? They've gone past them, and now a bit of stress. Oh no. Okay, these girls, I think they're just starting their last, last of the long laps. The Danes, you know, made the you know, front of the boat in, now they've got a problem. You see, the front of the boat's in the water, there's nowhere to put the back, the Germans have gone in, now they've put the boat on the outside of the Germans, now the Germans are stuck. So, a little bit chaotic, but you can see that the Germans got nowhere to go. It was a mistake by the, the uh, front girl in the Danish boat there, should have put the waited for her partner to put the boat in first and they could have been away but they are definitely I mean that's a high speed exit from the portage they're definitely pressing on and K1 there also making the most of a, uh, a gift the Germans just struggling slightly and here come the Polish girls through the portage These girls are uh, heading for their final uh, full lap, final long lap. Uh, next time they are coming into the portage, it's the final portage. And uh, from that on, uh, we will see very tough racing, of course, uh, to decide who is going to win. So as we enter our period of downtime again, all the athletes at the far end of course we've got nice visual there of the junior junior man that's the second group two Norwegians two Hungarians and that's just a <laughs> that's actually stopped and I'd say that's four boys who are just disappointed that they're not up the front end of this race they don't know what they're racing for at the moment it's not close enough to the end for them to be racing for positions and they're just kind of lost in a vast gap between the front group and the following group behind them. There's no reason for them to be pressing on and they can't decide who's going to cover the distance.
Nice long shot from the boys there, and then back to the women's K2. So we got the graphic up for the women's junior K2. Two boats clearly out in front. It's the Germans and the Danes, and then following up in third place is the Polish boat 358. They have a significant gap on the boats behind them. Spanish now both drop back. And then Hungary on fifth position, then uh, Belgium. Uh, on sixth. It's interesting Belgium is another Brox uh, on these courses. Um, the Brox, Brox uh, family uh, have uh, been participating in international racing for decades now. This time it's uh, Ruth Brox. I think she's the niece of uh, Lisa Brox that uh, had a medal okay. last year. You get a lot of that in canoe racing. Yeah, a, lot. racing. a lot of family tradition. Uh, sometimes you're on to third generation paddlers. Absolutely. And, uh, it is, it is interesting. The, the, the sport seems to sort of work its way into your family DNA and the, the, the enjoyment flows through that family line. And it's so, so much uh, good experiences uh, traveling around with the parents uh, doing all, all these races. So you really will be brought into it. So that's the Italians there emptying a, well, a, almost a full boat of water. Who knows how that got in there? That's, either they've tip the boat up a little bit getting it in at the previous portage or possibly even a hole in the boat to have that much water in most of most of the athletes they use foot pumps in the kayaks uh, that they manage uh, with their feet there's a lot of details uh, to um, yeah, ensure they work uh, before such a race and it's also very obvious that the top guys uh, almost never have any problems with their boats or pu pumps or anything like it while down down at the result list it's, it's more or less always it's a little that, bit random yeah, yeah people do have problems and, and that comes with experience as well as the the professionality of your own approach exactly especially that the professionality yeah. of your own approach when you're uh, focusing uh, to win quite hard and do all the training that is needed it's not an option to have a foot pump that, that doesn't work to have a foot rest that br breaks or a rudder that doesn't work or something like that so these guys are checking all their stuff very very carefully and make sure that uh, nothing will happen um, maybe for me it wasn't me that ever checked that i was useless at that kind of stuff it was always my coach my coach that was his responsibility he took care of all that. When I got in my boat, I knew that the rudder was in the middle, the wires were tight enough, the steering was going to work, the pump was going to work, and I was just the paddling monkey that had to perform in the in the race. So I checked a lot of things uh, myself, but I had a, a great uh, support guy that uh, made all 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 the things yeah. on my boat. Uh, he followed and he he made uh, he did a wonderful work. Uh, making the boat suitable for the close to two meter Stefan. Yeah. <laughs> and you've know, got Magnus Gregory in this race. He's got his coach here with him, Tom Daniels. They operate a Longridge Canoe Club, probably the best group in our country at the moment in terms of progression. Uh, absolutely doing a phenomenal job there. And Tom, he's been in the marathon team. He's got marathon medals at junior level and he will be making sure that boat's right for Magnus. And it takes a lot of the pressure off you as an athlete when you've got a coach who's prepared to do that. A bit of a mixed bag here going on. Still Danish K2, German K2. Now those K1s there, that is interfering with the race, Stefan. The bit between the Danish K2 and the German K2, and one of the judges needs to tell them yeah. to get out of the way. It's okay taking an opportunity if one's presented, but to actually be in the way of another race is really unacceptable. It will cause at least a penalty, I think. So the leaders in the junior K1, they're just approaching. Oh, here we are, they're on shot now. They're about another minute and a half away from the portage again. Again, nothing too exciting. You imagine here they got one more long lap. Yes, after one, this, more, one and, more long lap, and then the short lap. So the next long lap is really it's a it's a trade-off. You need to rest, but you need to be in the right position of the group. You need to establish that you're faster than someone. They need to know that you're faster than them 
it, it's, it's something you're just showing off essentially there's an element of showing off in the last lap this is what I've got and those guys need to know it you need to introduce an element of insecurity into the other guys but at this stage this is just a little trip into the portage as Ziggy comes round make himself a little bit safer maybe unnecessary that he could have stayed in the yes. in the diamond yes um, he's opting for safety over recovery and that's his choice he's not he's not stupid he's well educated in fact <laughs> he maybe was stupid because he's just reassessed his position and gone back into the diamond so uh, a, a little feel, error of judgment there yes uh, maybe but he want to feel uh, secure uh, maybe into the portage having the lead uh, it's a good feeling yeah creates men mental strength doing that. So it looks like we've got one going left, three coming right maybe, or is Ziggy going to go left as well? Good decision, Ziggy. The pontoon is long and enough to... Pontoon's plenty long enough. The Danish are in control here. They could, at this stage, run long yes. and stop the English getting yes. out. But They've been very well behaved. Yeah. It's very, very well, organised. a small little tiny gap for themselves. I think it will close over yeah over the porches although they're running uh, like they mean it that's yeah. the, oh wow bit of chaos there that yeah. was not great missed, from the they, no. they missed both of them uh, I think. yeah at least one they yeah. missed the drinks for for the last a little step over there from Daniel Hansen not sure why he did that he's now got three people on the right side of the pontoon one on the left seemed a little unnecessary but he's he's going to be the last oh, away yeah Last away, and he, he could have been second away yeah. there. I, I yeah, don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know really why. understand that, but uh, he, 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 it's also, he thought also something through. He, yeah. he had some sort of plan. Maybe it wasn't the best plan, but it was his plan, and uh, but it, it's might also risky do, doing it that way. Put, throwing the boat on the ground it could damage the rudder. How many times have you seen someone step on their boat exactly. when they try and step exactly. over it like that? Stumble and yeah. Uh, and then Four. they need to stop to fix their other and then they are off. It's over, yeah. Second group now, they're, re they're, yeah, they're a long way behind now. Yes. A long, long way. One and a half minutes about. Yeah. The front group, we can see, you can't, they're leaving that portage and Danish in the red boat, um, Winter, he made a good solid effort and that's now come to an end. And now it's a Magnus great... Magnus Gregory's pushing on after yeah. that. He's pushing on quite hard now, and uh, now, yeah, he's he's making an effort now. He saw that um, that uh, Dagnus Hansen was uh, a little bit uh, off, and he's making a big move. But I think they soon will be together again. Yeah, it's regrouping again. So apologies yeah. on commentating on something you couldn't see there, but it did seem the more relevant part of the race. This is the second group coming out on the portage. Nothing too exciting to report there. It's Hungary. It's uh, Shaba Erdasi. In that group, the, f the first Hungarian. Actually, the most significant thing that's going to happen to that group now is they could possibly be caught by the German and Spaniard who are only about it's 40 seconds behind on another long lap. This, it's this seems so little motivation in that second group now. And it's Magnus Ibarsen, uh, Norway, and um, also uh, Vold from Norway uh, leading that group. Ibarsen and Vold. Uh, there's, there's the scan through to the front group and that's the view they've got and that is a long gap it's a it? very long gap everything's settled again in the front group this is their last long lap the next portage they do is the most significant portage of the day for them it's the last portage before a thousand meter finish or e even shorter you're saying 750 maybe yeah. 500 even yeah. but a very short up and back to the finish from what you've seen it's really hard to judge who's who's the fastest in yeah, that group now. Yeah. I mean, it's nice that Mag Magnus Gregory caught up when he was behind. That's fairly significant. He's That shows a bit of strength. Also, then he re-established himself at the front for the second portage. Yes. That tells me he's on a good learning curve mm. and he was confident enough to go to the front. So I, I fancy Magnus Gregory's chances. Maybe I'm a little biased. But hey, I've got the microphone, so I'm, a yeah. <laughs> I'm allowed to have an opinion. And Nikolai Winter uh, made a good, uh, good portage. He seems to have <coughs> experience enough to 
to uh, not do any mistakes in that uh, final decisive por portage. Uh, and he was Danish even clean guy. on the first portage yeah, as yeah, well. So clean. yeah, you got to you got to look at that. Maybe if he can get a length lead or half length lead, you only need to come out of the portage in front. Then yeah. you've at least got you, you're dictating what happens. And he was uh, there also last year. Uh, when he finished eighth, so he he has uh, some experience out of it. And here the third group is coming in. We had Spain in the in between the groups, but uh, here's the third group. Coming into the portage, and it's uh, Andre Antal from uh, uh, Slovakia, who is leading that group. And he's together with uh, Alessandro Tovo from Italy. And uh, Guillaume Keller from France is also there in that third group. Challenging his drink system for the next lap. Do you think there's any significance that both the Danish failed to get their drinks there at that portage, Stefan? Or okay, sorry, I've Stefan's out looking at the uh, junior women's K2 race, which had a significant break. The Danes are now 20 seconds, maybe 15 seconds ahead of the Germans. Exactly. Now uh, they have made a decisive move uh, up there, out on the course. It was quite unusual to to do that, actually. Uh, they have managed to get rid of uh, of uh, Germany uh, on pure strength, uh, paddling speed uh, along this uh, last big lap. And all, uh, all the all the interference of the K1s. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe so. Yeah, we you could well find yourself with a complaint here. Yes. To, to deal with after the race. I mean, yeah. if if it was the K1s that upset the German wash hanging, then they're not going to be happy about that. Not at all. But it seems like uh, the Danes do have a greater speed now they are increasing the the gaps uh, stroke by stroke now heading for the last final portage just 500 meters before the finish line denmark denmark uh, line langelund and katrin rask into their final portage these guy these uh, uh, two girls from silkeborg silkeborg that is one of the uh, most experienced marathon clubs in the world, uh, organizing also Tour de Gudenau. Here they are, uh, Line Langlund and Katrin Rask, and I think their trainer, F trainer Finn Pape, is uh, really, really pleased with this, uh, with these girls now. Line Langlund and Katrin Rask from Silkeborg, Denmark, in the lead of European uh, Championships uh, Women Junior K2. There's really nothing that can stop them from here, is there, Stefan? The Germans are just getting out of their boat now, and they're not in any hurry. No, they're gonna not at stop. all. They stop. They're emptying their boat out. They've settled for second place, and yeah, hopefully they'll be happy with second place. I mean, I to, think they are. to take on Catherine Raska, and she was so dominant yesterday. Yes. And like you say, you don't often see German junior K2s doing well, so it's a big result for them. They, yes. They'll be happy with that. And the Danish crew off from the portage now, just 500 meters more to go. These girls that uh, had a fourth uh, position in the Junior World Championships on 500 meters uh, last year as well. So they are used to this distance. Uh, these girls that also are Olympic ho hopes for, uh, for uh, Denmark in a spe specific uh, effort from the Danish Federation uh, for the Olympics uh, in the future. And that's just another example of how the marathon and the marathon training, the marathon events can help your sprint result in the end. The Danish have got a good history of women's K2 sprinting and they're still using this as a preparation event for their World Championships and Absolutely. it's great to see that. It's Absolutely. great to see it, it that is. sort of enlightened thinking. Exactly, exactly. That's how it should be done. Third K2 crew in sh on shot now, that's the Polish. Only just ahead of the two chasing crews, which is Hungarian and Belgians. They've just got a gap of about ooh, 15 seconds. They, they are not allowed to do any mistakes now to secure their bronze medal. 
Yeah, a mistake of this portage could be yes. <laughs> could be crucial for them. But depending how tired they are. Veronika Piotas the and uh, Maja Kolovska from Poland. Then they come to the portage, and there you go. There's your mistake right there. They've actually capsized on the portage. They're not going to have time to empty that boat out. And oh, they, they can't even no, can't lift even the lift boat. the boat out. So it's oh, over. It's over. It's over for them. Yeah, I think so. I think so. They lost yeah. their, their medal there now. But everyone else has stopped also. So the Hungarians have stopped. They got. They came to the same side of the pontoon as the accident. It's oh, just. Yeah. And Hungary had also some problems yeah. there. They got stuck to, uh, with the Polish girls there. Yeah, that is your basic stuff that you have to do right. And it's, we've repeated it again and again. But you can see how easily things slip away. The Polish were safe in their bronze medal. All they had to do was come into that landing stage, get out of the boat and run through the portage. Now they're still in the water angry with herself she's hitting the boat and it's hungry it, it's hungry on the third position now i think if the camera hasn't missed anything no, I, think, else. I think it was the belgians in the belgians. Third. belgians were ahead of the hungarians they came into yeah, the yeah. with them and the hungarians got held up they chose the same side as the pontoon yes. as the incident and the belgians all they had to do was choose the right hand side of that pontoon and they could be also in with a chance of bronze so and now it's it's fourth place for them so it's Belgium then. They were in sixth position in the previous uh, portage and now uh, moving uh, for a medal, I think. It's not them, that's Hungary. Or did uh, Belgium have another accident in the portage? In the portage, or? I don't know. We haven't seen them leave the portage, have we? Who have we got? There's two Hungarian crews there. It's two Hungarian. It's Hungary. Yeah, it's definitely Hungary. So uh, Hungary oh. on third position, sorry for this uh, confusion. And there's the Belgians behind them. So something must have happened yes. to them on the portage that we didn't see as well. They're also looking very wet. Yes. So maybe getting into the portage. So absolute chaos at the end of the, yes. the women's K2 race. But all yeah, they are, they're wet through those girls. They've been swimming as well. Just with what, what? Just 150 meter more to, more to go. Can we have the camera to, uh, to the finish line now? Uh, just 150 meters or so more to go is um, Lina Langeland and Katrin Rask from uh, Denmark taking another gold for Denmark in, Denmark in U junior women racing this weekend. Watch them, they are really do doing this uh, nicely. These girls from Silkeborg, Denmark and their trainer Finn, Finn Pappe might be very very happy as their t team, team coach uh, Christian and themselves of course. Fantastic Europe. effort from those yes, girls. They were really, there really nice. From the start, they paddled away from all the other teams except the Germans very early on, and then actually broke away from the Germans themselves. European champions, uh, junior women K2 is Denmark. Lene Langeland and Katrin Rask. Fantastic effort. In come the Germans now in shot. They'll also be pleased with their result. Silver medal for them is probably. Uh, Min and Mac more than they expected coming into this. You wouldn't assume naturally that you would come ahead of the, the two Hungarian K2s in a junior women's race. That you'd have them featured above you normally, and these girls will be very pleased to have uh, sent the uh, the Hungarians a message. And now Germany, Germany heading for a silver medal, another medal for Jule Hake, who had a bronze medal yesterday. And now together with Pia Engelhardt, uh, they are making a silver medal for Germany in junior women K1 this year. I think it is the first uh, junior women K K2 medal for Germany uh, for European Championships ever for women, junior category women. Julia Hake and Pia Engelhardt. So here we go. This is the, the bizarre contest for third place that we've seen unfold. I think we're looking at two Hungarian crews there. Crew in fourth place still fancying their chances, They're still pressing on, but the distance is just running out for them. They're not going to catch the crew in the yellow boat. 
So there will be a medal for Hungary despite how it looked early on in the race. And this medal really was gifted to them. Yes, absolutely. They're coming in last last 50 meters really for these girls. And really, in terms of going home with a medal, these girls have been very, very lucky. And that is Annette Fritz and Frusinagal from Hungary, bronze medalist, junior women K2. Followed closely by their compatriots, both 356. That's Dora. Zolossi and Laura Sima. It would be really handy for the commentary team if all the teams wore the exact same kit. Yes. And the Belgian crew, 355. They had a bit of an adventure out there today in the final lap there. They had a shot at a medal at the closing stages, but it didn't pan out for them. But really, it was the Polish girls who were the big losers on that final lap there. I don't, know, I don't know if they've even continued in the race. We might see them finish later on, but... Come the Spaniards now, first of the Spanish crews. Three, five, four. No, yep, three, five, four. Lucia Seitz and uh, Jara Lopez-Pinos. Lopez-Pinos raced yesterday. They're coming into the finish. Sixth. And I think they are sixth position, six, sixth position for Spain. And then uh, sorry girls, but now it's the final portage for the men, and uh, we really want the and cameras uh, for, for on the men now. This is the big burn up for the portage. Magnus Gregory has gone it alone out to the left. And on the right is Winter. These have been the two strong guys. There's Gregory from Winter. It's hard to tell at this angle who's got the advantage. I would say it's Gregory at this stage. Moving very well. But we know Winter is very well organised on his porches. Ziggy Chamil coming around Winter now. And it's Britain, it's Britain, Denmark, Denmark. And it's uh, Gregory and it's uh, Schigel and it's uh, Winter and it's uh, Douglas Hansen. Dee Jamil really needs to get a little bit more ahead before he comes into the portage to be safe. And that looks very good for the Great Britain guys. A nice tidy portage here. We've seen what can happen. Gregory not too comfortably out of his boat. Ends up kneeling on the landing stage, but they're both up the ramp first. So Great Britain versus Denmark. It's all going to be on the put-in. We've seen mistakes there before. And it's Gregory. Gregory is running. His, his long legs is carrying very fast, but that's uh, also true for Siggy. And Winter is doing it very well over the porches as well. Douglas Hansen is a bit uh, exhausted, as it seems. So one each side. Keep it tidy. Keep it calm, guys. Keep it calm. And both away well. This looks like a 1 2 for Great Britain for me. Winter just closing in behind them, but it's Gregory. He's pushed away and he's pulling off fast there. And Winter is uh, struggling hard now to, to get on the wash once again. I think he will manage. Now he has to choose which of these Great Britain guys is going to be the leader at the finish. For yes. my money, it's going to be Gregory, so he should be going to Gregory's side of that group yeah. now. He shouldn't be second washout. It's too hard there for him. He's got to tuck in behind Gregory to have any chance of even getting a silver medal here. And now he's on the inner side at... Uh, as well, uh, at the final final turn, it might be any problem, but uh, it could be. If uh, Gregory is uh, pushing hard now, he could really squeeze uh, squeeze Winter around the final turn. He doesn't even need to. At this stage, Winter's working harder than Ziggy. Gregory is in control of the race. For Winter to come up and get anything but a bronze medal here, he would have to close Ziggy out, and that's not going to happen at this stage. Ziggy beat him into the portage. He already knows he's faster than him. Really, Winter should be on the left of Gregory here. Yes, he made a, r a wrong tactical decision there. Gregory is, it's Gregory is to lose now. He's the faster of our two guys on the sprinting, but now it comes down to who's tired. 
Yes. It's just uh, 300, three, 400 meters more to, more to go. And they have a turn. We saw Siggy uh, was uh, Ziggy's, looking for... Siggy's just checking that he's got yeah, a medal. Yeah. <laughs> Medal's in the bag. Now he has to choose the color. That decides a little bit of his tactics as well, I think. He was uh, watching if Dagnus Hansen was coming up. If not, uh, he could continue yeah, at a low speed uh, into into the turn. But look so at that. Winter, winter. Winter. that. That's his only, the only chance he has. He, he needed... And he's, and he's failed. That's hugely significant. Now he has to be on the wash of the leader. Whoever yeah. the leader is coming out this turn, Winter needs to go yeah. to that leader. Exactly. As we said, he is a little bit squeezed there. Nothing unlegal, but uh, it was not a good uh, position for him. And uh, now he's off, and now he's uh, coming up on the other side, but it's, li it's a little bit too late. A little bit too late. He's choosing a longer ro route there. He realized he must be on uh, Gregory's uh, wash now, and he's struggling hard now to get there. Or is Ziggy Chamil leading now? It's hard to yeah, tell from here. Yeah. I think Chamil's taking yeah. the lead. So for all that work that Winter did to come around to Gregory's side, he's been held off again. Yes. He's they're, they're working him over. He's trying now on his own. Win Winter is trying on his own now. I think Winter looks like he's spent. He's gone, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he so, is. So it's Great Britain going to be first and second. It's going to be a big tussle to see who gets these medals. These guys have been close all year. There are two outstanding juniors. There are no juniors at home to touch these boys. They 200 are. meters more, more to go. The speed is great. So Ziggy Chamil from Gregory, and here goes Gregory. It's going to be big. Chamil looked at him straight away. That was a capitulation right there. He yes. knew how tired he was. He knew what Gregory had, and he knew immediately that he couldn't match that. So it's going to be Gregory from Chamil, from Winter, and it's a Great Britain 1 2. Fortunately, I predicted that from the start, Stefan. So I'm, I'm, did, I'm, yeah. look, I'm looking well educated at this stage. <laughs> You, so, know, you know these guys well? I know them very well and uh, much respect to these two for what they've done here today. This is this, this is massive for, for canoeing in, in Great Britain. Uh, that's not significant to the rest of the world, I know, but what's happening here is a big deal back at home today. This is fantastic for these guys. It's fantastic for club canoeing in Great Britain. It's fantastic for their coaches and for their training groups and for the sport as a whole. That's Magnus Gregory across the line, followed by Ziggy Chamil. This is absolutely brilliant for us it couldn't have gone better and um, winter he knows that he can't be caught he's going to take the third and i think he's pleased with that he's happy with his result a big day for great britain a new generation coming up now for for marathon a new british generation coming for marathon for sprint i mean these are the first two guys we've had with real future for quite a long time now both and in sprint and marathon. Both then? in sprint and marathon. Yeah, they are they are top quality athletes. They're both free thinking individuals. They're doing what's right for them. Second day and cross the line now in fourth place. Dagnus Hansen, uh, fourth position. Good race also for him. Good day for Denmark, winning uh, the, the women K2 and then uh, th third and fourth position in men. So new generation, new strong generations, both on the British, for the British and for Denmark. And all of them is doing both sprint and, and uh, marathon, which is significant for in this age and really, really good. Congratulations the to their coaches, Tom Daniels, Norman Mason, Norm Plan Group gets a medal at the Europeans and the Longridge Canoe Club who've moved canoeing in Great Britain forward over the last couple of years. A medal for them couldn't have panned out better. Really pleased for everyone involved with those guys. Justified in their decisions, but they've made difficult decisions for those boys over the last few months. They've come under a lot of pressure back home, but they are very happy with how things have panned out for them. Hopefully, if we're lucky, maybe we can get an interview with one of them later. We're not sure if we've got the equipment to do that, but if I can, I'll interview them and uh, we'll get that out to you later today. Please try, Owen. You, you can try.
Now Ivan is uh, heading off to try to make uh, some interviews, if we can have the equipment working for it. Uh, And a great in sprint uh, for um, uh, sixth and seventh position between uh, Nico Poffler from Germany, whose uh, brother Marcel Poffler raced uh, yesterday in the uh, under 23 category, and he's together with uh, David Bottieri from uh, from uh, Finland, number se seven, number 17, uh, Erik Petro from Hungary. Number 17, Eric Petro from Hungary. And then uh, followed uh, Andrei Antal from Slovakia and uh, uh, Dimitro Vespalko from Ukraine. And the uh, Shaba Erdasi from Hungary. Shame uh, number three from Spain, Jaime Noval. And uh, Jaros number 23 is uh, Amund Vold from Norway, who was among the top group for a long period of the race. Very, very good racing this morning. Very interesting to see uh, uh, the Danish crew making the effort out here on the excellent conditions on the Bochini um, lake this morning just going faster than Germany and uh, winning the gold medal for Denmark in the ladies K2 and then this very very ex exciting race with all the technical skills shown by the British team winning double here this morning Still excellent conditions, and um, now it's 45 minutes to the next start. And that will be very, very interesting, because then it's K1 women, K1 women uh, uh, that includes the queen of marathon racing, Renata Che. And she will be challenged by Lizzie Broughton from Great Britain. Uh, Lenka Hroba from Czech Republic and uh, Stefania Sikali from Italy and uh, also Anna Al Alberti from Italy all ladies that have done so many good good races uh, before in that race also Berenike Faldum from, from Bulgaria uh, who um, used to paddle K2 with Renata uh, 10 years ago so um, then paddling for Hungary is on that race so we'll, we will be back on that uh, 11.30 until then uh, grab a cup, cup of coffee and uh, hope, hopefully you can enjoy uh, this broadcasting from 11.30 on thanks a lot for uh, staying with us this morning and welcome back within 45 minutes. Okay, so we're next up. Next series of races includes the women's K1, senior women's K1, and the senior men's C1. Big interest here is in one of the stars of this competition, women's K1, Renata Sai. Already eight gold medals from European Championships to add to the 15 she has from World Championships.
has to start as the favourite for this event, but everything is not going to go her way, I'm sure, especially if the other girls have something to say about it. We've got uh, Lizzie Broughton from Great Britain, second in Oklahoma last year. She just goes from strength to strength. She's getting better and better. What used to be her weakness was her lack of speed, but that's been worked on, and now she has to be a contender. In addition to her, there's Susanna Sicali, and she's been there or thereabouts. Stefania Sicali, sorry. She's been there or thereabouts for many years. Third in the Europeans in Piestini just a year ago. She's won the under 23. She's won the junior at world championship level. And now she's here today to make a point and to try and end the dominance of Hungary and in spe specifically Renata Chai. The C1 race. That will follow on just five minutes after the K1s. Always an interesting one. We've seen before how the C1 races pan out slightly differently to the uh, K1 races, but Nuno Barros is the man to watch in there. Already European champion from a year ago, but he has the second, third, fourth, and fifth place from that race a year ago to contend with again this time. The usual suspects in that one, Hungary, Portugal, and Spain. Croatia also worth a mention in that race. So here we are at the venue, just a few minutes to go. The athletes are paddling around in front of us in their warm up to the race. So much to think about at this stage. You've got to control the nerves. Make sure you get on the start line. When you get on the start line, the officials always line you up too close together, don't they, Stefan? Exactly. There's a whole there's always a whole pontoon they put you in the middle bit and it adds to the excitement, it adds to the stress. It never feels like you have enough room. You and somebody next to you always wants to paddle on the same side that you're paddling on. And it's, it's quite a stressful situation to be in, but you've been in it before. The trick in those situations when it's tight like that is to look at the spaces. Don't look at the people. If you look at the people, you're going to run into them. It's going to get tight. If you look at the space in front of you, you'll always be safe. It just doesn't feel like it at the time. And then I, uh, you need to have been thinking of the tactics you're using at the first stage, uh, especially if you, if you are one of the, those who want to win. Um, could be different tactics and nowadays it's more of uh, just get on with it and get to the top group as quick as possible but if you know you're not able to do that it's it's a benefit it's a benefit to be on the uh, side of, of the groups and take take may maybe a little bit uh, longer route but to try to pick a good wash uh, at the side of the field but here they are now <coughs> here they are all of them in the middle we have Renata Chai the queen of marathon paddling and beside her Stefania Chikali who were second in Rome uh, and has so many good results and we're coming back to that and also Lisi Brot Broughton <coughs> um, uh, who were the second who had a silver medal last year in this event after Renata Che. Also on the far side there, of course, you've got Anna Alberti, Alberti, who has got a lot of good results in women's. Yes. And she is exactly like you say on the outside. She's not involved. The main contenders, they've lined up together in the middle, which seems a little bit odd to me. We might discuss that later. But uh, Albertini, you cannot write off. So away yes. they go. Renata Che there. Uh, in the middle in her yellow boat and it's Lissy Broughton it's and it's Lissy, Lissy taking the lead and it's Renata is trying to keep him up there. It's the two of them and now it's Renata. She, Lissy is relaxing now a little bit, uh, getting into her wash. And then it's Spain on the inner side here. It's Spain. It is... Um, yeah, you got the two Spanish girls. Yeah, uh, Nuria Vilas, Nuria Vilas, who, who who we now have uh, very good endurance and great speed, and she uh, uh, definitely wants to be among the to top guy, Nuria Vilas. We uh, recognize her from under 23 in junior racing uh, before. Uh, lots of good results also for for her, and also there uh, in the top among the top is um, the second Hungarian. Uh, paddler uh, that is uh, Noemi Mishku that I don't know much of uh, as Hungary has so many good paddlers and I haven't seen uh, Mishko uh, around It before. is just incredible they can just keep putting in more and more athletes that you haven't yes. even heard of before yes. and they're still up the front end. So we, we watched the start there they lined the three fastest or the three girls with the best results from last season together in the middle so they're always going to form that 
initial diamond. Exactly. And, which and kind of excludes a lot of other people who might have a chance to, to it, break it, into that diamond. Exactly so. But uh, on the other hand, it uh, makes the start a little bit more calm because uh, if they were on the on the end they would have uh, just uh, crashed straight through the start line after a couple of 50 meters and and uh, caused a lot of, of trouble there but now they are there and it's we are very very used to see exactly this uh, this happen in, in k1 women uh, over the past 10 years renata shea setting up a high speed forming a diamond around her and uh, just go for it. It's very hard to make a judgment from what you see yeah. from where we are. We see the first one minute maybe of the race, but there are signs there. So two, one good thing for me was that Lizzie Broughton initially hit the front of that race. So her speed isn't under question. But what was so ominous was that Renata's eye just matched her stroke for stroke. And then when she made the decision, boom, mm. she went, boom, half a length mm. up and job done. So, But now, Lizzie's now slotted into the V-Wash. She's got the V-Wash all the way to that top turn. And Just hopefully. as uh, they, they disappear there, we saw Stefania Chicali uh, getting on the left-hand side of, of uh, Renate, uh, trying to be among the, the top, uh, among the top into the first turn. And now we'll concentrate on the, the start of C1 men, uh, 11 boats uh, with um, the Hungarian Martin Kerber uh, in the middle, with boat number six, watch him, and also Ma Manuel Garrido. Both of them very, very experienced with many, many medals uh, over the years, and we are coming back back to their track record later. Also, uh, Nuno Barros uh, from Portugal, also one of these very experienced guys, uh, had have had medals all, uh, all the way since uh, the Worlds 2009 in Cristuma when I saw him first time. And he's got two European Championship wins already in 2011, 2014 and starts as favourite, I guess, being European, reigning European champion. Absolutely. Again, they put the four main contenders together in the middle. Should expect to see them lead off roughly from the start. At the top of, the pic uh, top of your screen there, the Hungarian on the far side, that's going to be Levanti Bala, who we saw race in the... Uh, well, he actually won the under 23s yesterday. Yeah, yeah. So he, he's uh, making his mark with the older guys here. That will be interesting. This uh, youngster coming up uh, uh, now and challenging the more experienced. And uh, also guys. the Czech athlete in this, Jan de Louis, he was in the under 23s yes. yesterday as well. So there's a bit of an overlap here. As it often is in this category. Uh, we have not mentioned uh, David Mosquera, the second Spanish guy, uh, who is also very experienced with many, many go good results over the years. Yeah, third and numbers. third last year yes. in this championship. They're making their way up the course. And uh, the, both these categories are doing uh, seven laps, seven laps on a four, about four kilometer course. And uh, doing six portages. The first lap is without the portage. And then the portage uh, on every lap. And, and after the final portage, it's just 500 meters uh, f uh, to go on, a in, on an in sprint. 250 meter out to a turn and then 250 meter in, into it. So <coughs> the final portage is quite decisive as we have experienced this morning. This well. morning we saw those junior boys race and you commented afterwards that actually that looked better and better educated, better organized, a, b a better field almost uh, than the under 23s the previous yes. day. Yes. What, what, why would you say that? I mean, what, what was it about that race that really appealed to you? I think uh, the, both the British guys and also the Danes uh, were, were very experienced and well-educated marathon paddlers and they knew exactly what, what to do in each uh, stage of the race and controlled the field from the start and made a very good uh, marathon race, Bo both of these crew, both of these teams. I interviewed uh, two Great Britain athletes afterwards and they said, yeah, they spoke amongst themselves once mm. they'd broken into that group of four, they decided that they'd create that gap working together and then the race began with mm. one long lap to go at the end and that's kind of what we said should be happening yes but it's great that 
under 18s have already developed that kind of mm. attitude towards the racing it was really good to watch they are coming from two very well developed uh, marathon nations and also clubs uh, i think so um, that's why I, and the latest race was similar uh, both these girls the danish girls that's one are from silkeborg and silkeborg is uh, one of the founding clubs for marathon racing actually uh, organizing the Tour de Gude you know, uh, every year. So here we go, we got the women's senior coming around that top turn. Sikali, Sai, Broughton, and the other Hungarian girl, Mishka. just get the name, Misko. She's making up that group of four. You'd have to predict that with those athletes in that group, that's going to be how it pans out now. It is going to be the winners will come from that group of four. They have already created this group of four, and uh, Renate, uh, her tactic used to be uh, go herself from the start, as she did in Rome, in a wonderful effort, uh, and the one with several minutes, and then, um, or create quick enough, create a group of four to be safe, no struggling, no fighting for positions, just cooperate and try to rest until the final. But it's, it's interesting. Chai can adapt her race. Like yeah. last year in in Oklahoma, she tried to go. Yes. But Lizzie went with her. Yes. And now she has to adapt to that. And in yes. the end, she just led at the speed she needed yeah. to lead at, rather than the speed she wanted yeah. to lead at. She let Lizzie do her work, knowing that she was faster mm. than her at the end. So she's capable of racing in a multitude of different ways, depending on the field she's contest contesting. The race and uh, last year before the Worlds she did some 5000 meter races and were among the top three but not better than that and this year you saw her in the World Games in Baku on 5000 meter yeah she she's yeah when you watch her race the 5k in Baku and the it was it was quite interesting because you can see then she's up against athletes that are slightly faster and you can see that there are there are gaps in her armor there are ways you can beat her so she had to come from behind to catch up the second group. She never got to the first the first group. The first group got gradually whittled down. So we got the, the graphic up there. We got Albertini, Alberti, Lamp. No, that's the second group. Sorry, I'm, no. I'm I'm misinforming you. No, I think I think that is the wrong uh, the wrong graphic. There's something something a little bit weird with that. We've seen that front group. Misko, Shai and Broughton. So maybe it's Alberti instead of uh, Sicali, who seems to be yeah. much lower down. So I was yeah. making the assumption that the Italian in the front group was Sicali. It is 24 seconds, yeah. yeah. Front, front group it, is Alberti, Misko, Shai and Broughton. And that would explain why Alberti was really piling on at that last yes, turn, because yes. she's seen an opportunity yeah. finally to take Sicali's crown from her. Very interesting. Alberti uh, is back again Al uh, among the top. Uh, she has been struggling a bit. Last year in the, uh, in the European Championships, she uh, pulled out uh, to save her strength for K2, I think. Uh, but uh, here, here she is once again now among the top. The very experienced Anna Alberti, who had a silver medal in Singapore. Uh, and she won the World Cup in Rome 2011, that was the World Cup, and they had a silver medal in K2 in Rome, together in the World Championships in Rome, together with Stefania Sikali. You can but see from the shots here, she is the one who's motivated to take that group absolutely. away. Absolutely. Very, very nice to see that she is really back in the top now. Uh, Anna Alberti from Italy, who had a silver, silver medal in K1 after Renata Shea in the World Championships in Singapore 2011. I think with someone the quality of Sicali further back down the field, you could possibly see a catching up scenario later on. Yes, uh, yes. Unless Sicali folds because she's got the K2 tomorrow, maybe she'll... Yeah. she'll win this race and hopefully get a better result tomorrow but with somebody of that quality in the second group there is a chance that things can change later absolutely, on absolutely absolutely which is probably why Albert is so keen to make that gap as big as possible mm. as soon as possible so onto the C1s there 505 that's Barros leading he's European champion He's still got an awful lot of company. In fact, the Hungarians come through on his inside. 506 as Martin Kova. No slouch himself. Spaniard, 504. They're the top three from the Europeans last year. 504, 505, and 506. 
And it's Spain again. Mosquera. There we have them. The graphic for that. Cover Barros, Mosquera. Ernikov. Ernikov is not an unknown. Uh, he's he's got results before. He uh, he was ninth in the C1 in Portugal a couple of years ago. Now ninth probably is a bit flattering because there aren't that many people in no. the race, so mm. it's ninth doesn't sound too bad. So maybe he'll fade a bit later on, or maybe he's he's stepped it up. Russia, Roman Ernikov from Russia. Bala, the under 23 winner yesterday. Just struggling to stay in touch with that group, according to the graphic. And in fact, on the screen there, you can see him in his blue boat. He's fallen off that main main string of uh, potential winners. So again, the under-23 winner hasn't quite cut it in the senior race. But, you know, he was hot out here yesterday when he was racing. He, he spent an hour and a half out there. And, and still, Alberti's pushing on. Still, yes, she, yes. she's got a plan. She knows what she's... She, she probably knows Stefania very well, and she yeah, knows she yeah, can yeah. destroy her if she races like this. So for her, I think it's stage, her 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 chance to try to do that. Anna Alberti is very endurance. She, she's not a sprinter, uh, but that is, that is the same for uh, Renate. So um, maybe we'll see these two try to cooperate a bit. And Lizzie Broughton is not a sprinter either. No, I mean, you've got you've got no sprint. Yeah, of those, you'd probably still pick Chai as, as the sprinter in that field. Yeah. But yeah, that that is one of the weaknesses Chai has. You can, if you had somebody with her at the finish who is a sprinter, yes. then she would be vulnerable. Yeah. And yeah, you know, we had this discussion on day one when we arrived. I mean, if you if you put uh, Chai, Hemmings and Susanna Gunnarsson in a bucket together, which one would come out alive? <laughs> Yeah. Very, very hard it's to say. Uh, very hard to say because uh, the other two were in the early ages of, uh, of marathon racing when the races were for 42 kilometers. Um, they don't have as many gold medals as uh, these, or medals overall, as these guys, these guys, these girls are having. But uh, back then, the, the World Championships were every second year only, so it wasn't possible to get uh, that ma many medals. But uh, they were also very, very good uh, athletes. And Susan had also a gold medal in, on 500 meters in K2 back so you, in so Atlanta. So you would fancy her chances on a sprint finish? Yes, absolutely. A Anna Hemmings could run unbelievably fast. She, yes. she came from a yes. cross-country running background when yeah. she was very young. Aha, okay. And she, she could run. And, mm. and with a portage 500 meters from the end, yeah. it, w it would be fantastic if you could call all yes. those people back in yeah. for one big race absolutely. at the end. Why don't, why, why don't include Jet Fredriksson as well? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We go right back to the beginning of time. Yeah. Unfortunately, of course, that can never happen, but it's a great conversation point. It is. We could have the same conversation with the men's race tomorrow, exactly. and I'm sure that everyone out there listening has an opinion. And they could send that opinion to us. Uh, if we, if got we had the, internet. Yeah, if we had internet working. <laughs> uh, which we, which we have sometimes, so please send, please send stuff. Uh, we will pick it up when the internet uh, occasionally works from here, uh, and we could have a great comments and a great discussion uh, with all of you watching this all over Europe. And maybe still uh, the safest place to send it to is my own Facebook page, Ivan Lawler, on Facebook. Everything else we're struggling with, it seems. But uh, yeah, send your comments in. Great to see Lizzie Broughton there, tucked in the back. That saved her the whole effort of the first lap, and that is good to see. And they have uh, already established a nice little gap, uh, le a little bit less than a minute to the second group. And I think uh, with Anna Alberti in front, this will continue to increase this gap. Can we even see Sakali from here? Is that her at the beginning of the third group, even? Yes, it is. It's so, yeah, that. That's a big gap to open up on anyone. I mean, if they did a time trial, they certainly wouldn't be that far ahead of her in one lap. There's a lot of psychology goes in with that. And Sikali warming up looks so strong as well. She looked like she meant business. She looked like she was had an intention to do this race well. And I don't know, that's obviously disappointing for her. Yes, it is. She is together with um, uh, Figueras, Aurora Figueras from Spain. And I doubt that Shikali will finish this race. Maybe she will pull out and save strength for K2 tomorrow after a couple of laps. It's always a trade-off on that. It's 
in some ways that's the right decision to make, but yes. actually you're out there now, you're representing your country. There's yes. someone left at home who didn't get the opportunity to race here. And for you to just chuck that race in and decide that it's not your day, mm. it's quite insulting almost to those that are left at home. Absolutely so right. It, so. it's, a, it's a tough call. But they're the calls you make as a full-time athlete, I guess. They're the, yeah, maybe it's a management call. Maybe yes. the management get a message to her at the first portage to say, you know what, love, it's not your day. Mm. But uh, there's always someone upset at home when the decision like that is being made. But they are also thinking of medals, and these top guys are heading for medals, and and uh, to save strength for another one, uh, a good opportunity tomorrow might be the right decision there for the management team, who also rely on medals and results exactly. to 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 get sponsors, to get some money in from federations. There's there's a there's always a bigger picture behind what you can see out here. Yeah, you know, it's great to see the Great Britain kayak team here. And finally, after probably years of drought, they've managed to get a clothing sponsor, which is not a big deal, mm-hmm. but it's a start. And, and to get somebody to, it's Joma Sports have bought them their clothing, and that's great news for them. They look smart as a team for the first time in, I don't know, when, can you, when was the last time you saw them looking smart? It's, mm, it's got to be five or six back years in the 90s, ago. Yeah. yeah. And finally, that's, yeah, they've got a team unity, and that's you know, a lot down to Keith Moore, who's put a lot of legwork in to get that sort of stuff and it's always hard work to get sponsors for a sport like this that doesn't get mainstream media attention but it's re- people are really grateful for those small things when you're in a sport like this absolutely whether it's your drinks whether it's your clothing it, it's you know somebody buys your paddle for you it, everything helps and uh, it's great that there are people around like Joma like Precision Hydration who've done the sponsors for for our team I'm quite convinced that the, our sport uh, can attract a lot more sponsors uh, if we have uh, a lot more media and we can build that ourselves and we need to think new there. And I mean, uh, what we are doing here is uh, one step. Uh, unfortunately, the organizers haven't managed to uh, create good uh, internet for us. So it's always th- these little small things that uh, that uh, hamper good development. It's, I- it's interesting though, Stefan. I, so far, this is my first time doing the commentary up till now I've been one of the outsiders looking in and complaining I complain I'm a, I'm a professional complainer to be fair but <laughs> I look out and it, from the outside looking in nothing's nothing's being done mm. now I'm sat this side of it and I see the amount of effort and the amount of money that's gone into trying to get this going there's a there's a lot more positivity from this side of, of the microphone than there is from the outside and I can assure all the viewers that efforts genuinely are being made to lift this whole thing to, to the status that it should have. So in front of us now, we've got the C1. Hungarian trying to string them out slightly. That's 506, that's Martin Kova from Barros, from the Spaniard, which is Garrido. And in fourth place, we'll just try and get a tag on his number. Actually, the, the Spaniard is Mosquera, sorry. 501. And Russia. 501, the Russian's still there. So he looks like he's going to improve on his ninth place from last year. Second group include the winner, Barros, from yesterday's under 23. Things not going quite the same way for him today, as we see so, so often when people step up an age group. But we have also been seeing him uh, doing exactly this and in the far end of the race he's up there and uh, fighting for medals. Uh, anyway, he's a very, very, very experienced, uh, experienced and he knows himself very, very well. And he's used to, uh, I was speaking to him a little bit this morning and uh, he's very used to the heat and likes that a lot and, and uh, he had good hopes for, for the race. We'll see how, how it turns out later on. But it's also interesting to uh, see that um, in this uh, C1 race, they are forming groups and they are using washes, uh, wash hanging, uh, in a much, much better way than uh, what we saw uh, in the juniors and under 23 yesterday. Yeah, and I, I guess, like anything else, that comes with experience, yes. it comes with, with age to a certain extent. and. Uh, because this, uh, 
these boats have no rudder, so they need to steer them with a paddle, and only that is a challenge. Have you ever been in one, Stefan? Yes, absolutely. And how did you get on? Um, I came <laughs> 25 meters or so. <laughs> Just in a circle in one direction, I'm guessing. Exactly, yeah. and then falling in, yeah. of course. It, it is incredibly hard. I mean, for anyone who's even like tried sitting in one of the racing kayaks, which is hard enough, I mean, it's not something you can do first time. For then to go into a, one of the sea ones and the canoes is another type of balance again, and it's uh, quite extraordinary how well they control the boats given how unstable and how difficult they are to paddle. So the women's race proceeds in exactly the same way. Yeah, it's just Alberti and Top and Renata so, Shea and Mishko on the wash, and they look, watch Lizzie Broughton choosing exactly the right position in that group. There's three girls there who can't believe their luck isn't it they're, they're getting a, a journey yeah. paid for by an italian <laughs> exactly and, uh, it, it's absolutely amazing that's that's like turning up for your flight and getting an upgrade yeah. to business class <laughs> <Yeah. isn't it? laughs> so alberti alberti there she, she knows exactly what she's doing she yeah, knows yeah, they're yeah, getting yeah. a ride but she's made that decision that that's that's going to be her best yeah. option and, yeah and you have to credit her for that she's yes. got a lot of laps to do yeah, yeah. she's just led for a lap and a half I did uh, that many times myself. I really like to to be in that position. I was uh, fit for it and felt very comfortable uh, doing exactly that. Uh, so it's a, it's a way of thinking, but also a way of preparing. If you're prepared to do that and know that you are more endurant that, than anyone else, uh, it's a safe tactic. Yep. Now lo looking at it from the outside, you might think that's not necessarily yeah, those other girls are getting a free ride. They might be stronger than her at the end. Maybe it's not a tactic to win, but if you know, like if, he, if she knows she can't win, then that's certainly a tactic to get in the medals, isn't it? I mean, she's she's broken that down to four. But uh, maybe, I, I mean, using such a tactic, you need a, a perfect race plan. You, know, you need to know exactly what to do uh, at every stage. You know you can control the control the race, so you really need a, a, race, a race plan that is uh, suitable for 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 that. Uh, the thinking there, I think, uh, what I was thinking, uh, making such race plans was to use the porters, getting up first, running uh, fast, and try to create a tiny little gap and then just go for it because I knew that no one uh, maybe except you could keep up with it so I did that many many times and, and when I followed the race plan it was always a success when I didn't uh, I failed so right. follow that, the race that plan a lot is, for a plan you yeah. know it's uh, there's so many different ways I mean we've, we've seen people race in different ways already mm. this weekend and win races from the front we've seen people come over the last 50 mm. meters and, and win races and uh, there's, there's uh, uh, Shikali. Shikali there that is somebody paddling around on their own not a happy day not, for her not happy at all I, I'm with you uh, I'll be very surprised if she finishes mm. this race so what yeah what do you put that down to I mean we don't know what training she's done we don't know uh, whether no. she's ill we don't well, there's so much we don't know I spoke to her a little bit uh, the, day, the other day and she was um, very focused and said she had practiced a lot so and, and like I said before she looks so strong in, in yes. warm up I mean you 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 have an overview when they're warming up and some people look good some people don't mm. in fact when when you're actually out there yourself everyone looks better than yeah, you feel, sure. don't they <laughs> and so you go along and all of a sudden everyone looks so much stronger and so much better than you ever felt mm. but she did look strong and she did you know she was taking the time to warm up she was doing her sprint she was doing mm. her stuff so she had intention of, of racing it hasn't panned out for her and uh I don't know. It's it's almost sad you see an athlete like that with that quality who's having a day like that. Oh, some people like to see others others fail. You know, successful people fail. But I I I always see a sadness in that. You, it is. That's somebody who doesn't deserve to be back there. It's a day she'd rather forget. She'll come off today and <laughs> erase it from her memory as soon as possible. I imagine. I always any of my bad races, I just denied that they ever happened, <laughs> and that. Yes, exactly. That's, it's the best way. Mm. Coming back to that um, discussion on, on the race plans, I mean, for a marathon race, you can prepare the, such a race plan 
months before for the important races to be able to, to train your, your your race plan as well. Uh, train it on every session, thinking of it. Uh, training every every moment of the race, uh, exactly the way you have figured out you should do it. And um, I use that a lot in life afterwards. Uh, it, it's the same in life, actually. The Put a goal. Competition, and the, uh, yeah, life, and yeah. goals. It's it's all there. It's all the same thing, just repeated, but without the water. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Just going out there and. Uh, uh, being opportunity driven is uh, it could be a, be a success but it's better to be opportunity driven within an overall plan yeah but I think you know opportunity there you, you said it you, you have to take opportunities sure. they present themselves it's so easy with an opportunity to have a fear of failure and if you have a fear of failure the, the, the fear of failure is the biggest bar to being a success exactly if, if you fear failure it's a good thing everyone fears failure I don't remember a single race where I lined up and wasn't scared of not, not doing well but you take that on the chin and, and that's the only real way to move forward yeah. exactly so yeah Renata Zay's out there now probability is in her mind she will win and she'll expect to win, and maybe that will come true. But you know what she really doesn't want to do <laughs> is lose, and that will be what drives her on, and that's what drives her on in training as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Renata has uh, quite an um, impressive record. You keep track of all her medals. Yeah, 15 World Championship, eight European Championship. 15 World Championships, that's impressive. Has anyone taking more? There is. There's actually a C1 paddler who's taken more. I've just turned to my list. So Edwin Chabai, he's got 17 already. Um, so he, he's taken more, but Renata's going to be racing K1 and K2 in her hometown this year. Uh, you, you'd have to bet on her closing that gap at least, even if she doesn't close it totally. So it all stays within the family then? Well, actually, no. You, you might be wrong about that because I think her other half is... Um, the, the other guy who paddled with the same era as Petivari. Ah, Kolosvari. Kolosvari, that's Vari. right. So, yeah, her I think husband, that's her other half. But he has yeah. also a very good track record with lots of medals. Yeah, so. yeah. Embarrassingly for us kayak paddlers, we think all C1 paddlers are the same person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, harsh on the, on the canoe paddlers there. But, yeah, I think it's interesting that actually most people watching this could name the main K1 medalists, yes, and the big the big scorers, Busto, you you could have in there, um, Merchan, you've got in there, McGregor, and uh, Busto with ten gold medals and but yeah, but to name uh, the yeah who's the third big highest medalist behind I think Chabai Gyore Gyore yeah Gure, who, C2 still, paddler yeah C2 paddler from and, Hungary and all his medals just team in the Gure. one class yeah and. Not many people out there would know that, I don't think, because the, the canoe all the medals in in C2 actually, yeah, over, which is over a wide phenomenal. number of years with yeah. a couple yeah. of different partners as yes. well, a lot with Chabai himself, obviously, yeah. and uh, yeah, so he's and maybe even one with Kolosvari back in the day as well. He certainly goes back a long way. Yes, it does. Kolosvari has a lot of medals as well. So yes. here comes. Uh, the four leading ladies uh, into the first portage and now I think uh, Renata in her yellow boat has taken the initiative into the portage as uh, we are used to see her over a decade of marathon, successful marathon paddling. The queen of marathon, Renata Che, leading uh, the group of four into the first portage. And I don't think we will see big efforts over this portage, they will stay together. There's also a slight wariness of someone of that stature, isn't yeah. there? The other athletes kind of almost let her do what she yes, wants to do. Yes. She's she's earned that right, don't yeah. get me wrong, but yeah, there, there's a, a slight standoffish. Yes. You, you want to first see what she does before you decide what you do. Mm. And and in order to beat her, sometimes it has to be the other way around. You have to make the Seems initiative. Seems like Mishko has uh, slightly slight pro problems there to keep up. This could go to one minimum and maybe two here very those very cool those first two could be up and away here did you see how stable she renata was when yeah. taking the boat out of the water just perfect now this, this is for renata to decide at this yeah. stage if she wants yeah. to leave from here 
You think she can do it? I would say She yes. is not touching the ground with her bow. Yeah. This, this is absolutely the fastest way of running with it. It's very easy, safe. Lizzie also absolutely superb yeah, on her yeah. portages. Yeah. She's done thousands of portages, especially over this winter. She also did the devices to Westminster this year. Straight through. She, got, okay. she actually won it, the oh, overall, with, with Keith Moore. So Watch this. is Lizzie and, the, and the Renate now. So now we'll see. Yeah, Renate is uh, setting up some speed yeah. now. Uh, that we are used to see that in some races. Last year she tried uh, and failed, but now she's trying once again and she's watch her technique now. This is just marvelous. It's so great to see her paddling so smooth. Like uh, they say in Hungary, she paddled like she like dancing. But now <laughs> she's uh, stopping. She's turned around and said to Lizzie, you know what? Yeah. This time you can do it. You can do it. I, th I think what Renate will have seen was the gap was big enough. Yep. already and she can afford to let Lizzie lead she knows Lizzie's fast enough on the lead and yep. Lizzie is very prepared to do a lot of work yes she is so so they they understand each other they understand each other's strengths and that's a two boat race from here on in now Bertie's only just behind them yeah uh, from here though she's still she's still within shouting distance absolutely she could close that Hungarian really no she's gone but can be done. We got Liz, we got Fay Lamp running through the portage on screen now. I think Alberti will be among them now. Yes, uh, she is catching the watch now, doing it uh, quite nicely there. Fay Lamp just about to put her boat in on the water. European champion in K2 with Lizzie Broughton. And there's the graphic. One and a half minute already between the two groups. Between the the main groups, yeah. It's, that's an unassailable lead, isn't it, anyway? Yeah. But uh, that, that graphic's slightly misleading. That's as they came into the portage. Now those gaps have changed completely. It's a three-boat race, it seems. Alberti's really... She's so close to catching up. Yes. You can't see it on screen, but she's so close to catching up, but hasn't quite made contact, it seems. She's, she's using the outer wash, uh, very experienced, uh, catching a wash there. Uh, on the outer side, uh, the wash, uh, the, the, the wakes from from the boats in front is forming a V behind, and it's possible to catch uh, that V uh, a couple of boats length behind and follow it uh, until they are on uh, close again. She's doing precisely that. So that's the second group there. It's Fay Lamp. Hungary, Spain, Great Britain. Spain doing the right thing there, dropping around the back of the Hungarian. Oh. It's not <laughs> Hungary, it must be. I might be misinforming you. My professional next to me is correcting me that might not be Hungarian. I'll have to wait for the next graphic to come up. Apologies if I've misled you there. Could be. Uh Berenike Faldum, actually, Bulgari. Oh, of course, she would yeah. be up there, thereabouts as well. Yeah. Uh, quite interesting character also, Berenike Faldum. Yes, it is. Paddling for Hungary. She had a gold medal together with uh, Renate Che in K2. I think it was back in 2008 um, or 2009 or something like that. Uh, on the World Championships in Tun or in Kerstuma. And then uh, uh, she switched, she moved to Bulgari and uh, she's now paddling for Bulgaria. So we've got Sikali coming into her first portage. Are we going to see her come out at the other end, Stefan? Mm, I doubt. Followed by Germany and Belgium. Get some names on those if we can see some Pia numbers. Room, I think, from... Pia Room from Germany. And um, uh, Stein Verlinden from Belgium. And now the Cetos C1s are approaching. They are still four. That's quite high speed coming down there as well. You can't see them on your screen. They're about 100 meters from the portage. We're just on the portage now. See the girls going through, and here they are. That's Barros in the lead. Russia, the Russian guy, uh, Roman Erle Erle Erlenikov. Uh, he was trying to choose uh, another 
course there, but our he's actually having some problems to follow now. It's hard Early once once call. those boats go back over the waves. It's so hard to yeah. keep directional control was, of them. Yes, he, he's done well. I mean, he's he's tucking into the back there. You you make an assumption that's deliberate. He's gone to the side where there's only one other athlete. Or is, no, there are three of them. Barrows, uh, Barrows, uh, coming out first. Both out of the boats well, Hungarian and Barros, Spanish guy also running well. And these guys don't have any rudder to protect, so they can just dra drag their boats behind them. We saw Barros emptying the boats with, with a clever move of one hand. So that's Kova, first through that stage, then Barros, then Mosquera, and then Erlinekov. And Barros won uh, last year with uh, Kova on the second uh, position, and the bronze was with uh, Mosquera. So same first three as last time, with the addition of the Russian, Olenikov, who so far looks quite good. And they leave that portage. Can't quite see them from here, but it's... Uh, it's Kerber. It's Kerber that uh, has a couple of boats length and he's pushing hard now. He's really moving hard, Kerber. Kerber, who uh, was second on the Europeans uh, last year with Nuno Barros as first, but in the World Championships in Oklahoma, Martin Kerber had a silver medal and Nuno Barros uh, a, um, a bronze. So they are very, very equal, these, these two guys. And Kerber increased the gap now, it's Barros and it's Mosquera that is uh, trying to keep up with the speed of Kerber, but they they don't seem to manage that. Kerber is flying, really flying now. Barros taking a look behind him there as well. If you want to close a gap like that, you really need to be looking forwards yes. rather than backwards. It's, uh, so Kerber's made a significant break there. So that group that came in as four is left as a single, a pair, and then another single. And the race in Oklahoma last year, it was uh, similar conditions, very hot, and the curve uh, fell off a bit uh, to start with, the first uh, couple of laps, and then came back uh, tremendously in the final stage of, of the race. So he is a very endurant peddler, and I now it seems like he wants to be very, very dec decisive. Uh, Barros again looking backwards. So Kova, he's made his break. It's a long way to go still. But hopefully he's done his planning. He's got his race plan, as Stefan says. And he's going to execute that race plan to the best of his ability. And uh, Barros had uh, his first gold medal in the, the World Championships in uh, Banyoles. 2010, when he, where, when he won, uh, before Manuel Antonio Campos, Campos that won the World Championships uh, last year as well. F four years later in Oklahoma. So Italians see why I'm running through the portage there, along with the Slovakian. You think it'd be warm enough to go without long trousers today, wouldn't you, Stefan, the Italian there? He's taking no chances for sunburn today. Yeah. What do you think? His mum told him to be careful, or he's made his own decision there? <laughs> so, as the paddlers make their way up to the top end of the course, it's very hard for us to see them from there. Nuno Barros has a long, long history in the marathon racing. He appears first time in the records back in 2004, actually, um, at the World Cup in Portugal, Cristuma, back in 2004, when he won K2, C2 together with José Sousa, another experienced uh, Portuguese uh, C2 paddler. Shot of the second group of the ladies there, Faldem. 
world champion in the past, as Stefan said, with Renato Zay herself. Faye Lamp leading that group out. Fallon was uh, with also in that group. Yeah, and Fallon was uh, had also a bronze medal in Rome, 2012, uh, in K1 for Bulgaria. The longevity of these athletes is there, isn't it? People yes. stay around for a long time. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure how long Busto was at the top for, but it's about 10 years, isn't yeah, it? That yeah. People, people sort of loiter around in the races, yeah. and it's it's a long long career in a sport like this. You. The young guys can do quite well, but you learn with experience and you stay around. And eventually it's the experience that keeps you in the front group rather than your physicality. So as your physicality fades, you're still in with a chance. And it's a, in 10 years, you can see what, how many places, two or three trips a year to World Cups. That's 30 different countries you can go to yes, in 10 years. Exactly. That's, that's exactly. not bad. That's not bad. And a lot of other interesting races in between. All these classic marathon races. I know Busto have done a lot of them. Uh, He's the king of the Sela race. Yes, in, king in of Spain, the Sela and, and uh, king of many other races as well. And the South Africans are doing, and many of the athletes are doing surf ski as well. And yeah. Combine mm. surf ski and marathon, and that that makes them world traveler. Uh, and a very very nice life to live. Probably all have gold cards for the airport lounges yeah, and sure. everything. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> There's that much travel yeah. as an athlete. The, yeah. the, these things are possible. Yes. You no longer have to stay in the airport with all the poor people. <laughs> you, can, you can go into the lounges. Of course, you're a canoeing star. Yeah. <laughs> these are the perks of the job. So if you are out there wondering whether this is the life for you, you might want to factor that all in. Absolutely. Renata Shea is, uh, I think she's 35 now, 34 or 35, uh, two kids at home. Uh, but she says, uh, keep on going. And to be fair, if those two kids hadn't come along, she'd have a, a higher medal tally than she has. Yeah, yeah. She was away for a few years with the kids there. Yes. So, uh, remarkable. Not come everyone does as Susan Gunnarsson did. She had a kid and uh, three weeks after, she had a gold medal in the World Championships in Amsterdam. Uh, <laughs> That's quite exceptional. Uh, uh, and three or four weeks, maybe it was four weeks. Borderline insane? Or... <laughs> or is that normal behaviour for Swedish people? I uh, think so. I, okay. She's a real Viking wife. Yeah, so. okay. Maybe all those hours in darkness in the winter starts to affect the, the mental processes. I won't go into <laughs> that. <laughs> but yeah, you have to admire people who've got that much drive yes, to do that. And, absolutely. Uh, and that, it, that, it, it's that sort of drive, although maybe that's an extreme example, but it is that sort of drive that gets you to the top of whether it's your sport, your profession, it, it's with whatever field you use that drive in, it will help you out. And so this C1's afternoon we have uh, other very experienced paddlers, the Spanish guys, they are all something about 35 or so, yeah. and still is racing very, very strong. But that we will comment on. Uh, in the afternoon when the K1 men races started at f starting at 14.45. So, Kova, Kova was caught in the C1. Yes. They closed that gap. It wasn't all over. I'd be really interested to find out who closed that gap, mm. whether it was uh, Barros or Mosquera, but someone did, or, or maybe Kova changed his mind. Yeah. I mean, you can be out there and a lot of thoughts go through your head. You work out how far you've got to go and actually maybe you just need some company mm. to cover that ground. I think uh, Barros has uh, small disadvantages <coughs> on this uh, on this course because uh, we are doing the course clockwise, not as usually anti-clockwise, and he's paddling on his on the right-hand side of his boat, and that could make uh, a difference in the in the final turn. Not much, but uh, anyway, a bit. Maybe, maybe the margins aren't going to be much at the end of no, this race, exactly. so I guess every little helps. But yeah, those guys. They're so skillful in their boats. Yeah, we kind of a, as non-educated C1 pilots. Our assumption is that paddling on the outside of the turn is going to help, but I, they go so close to the boys, even paddling on the wrong side as well. So, you know, perhaps we're airing our lack of knowledge yeah. <laughs> rather, yeah, rather yeah, than yeah. Uh, yeah. airing our knowledge. It's, always, it's so. always a fine line. So the three leading girls together. Once again, on Alberti in top. There's no true rest anymore. There's no V-Wash. There's only the three of them. 
Anna Alberti, it seems, is just happy yeah. to, to be doing this. She's now got her medal, which is, that's a start. That's your start point. Mm -hmm. They've broken it down to the medal positions. And and that is that, that will be the characteristic of, of, of this race from now on, I think. Uh, they have the uh, medal positions now, and they have a good enough gap uh, to the second group, about two minutes now. So uh, they won't uh, set up any very high speed uh, if not... Uh, uh, Anna Alberti really want to try to tire the others out, but I think both Lissia and Renate is endurant enough. They're to not people follow. you'd fancy no. your chances no. at tiring out. No. To be fair, I mean Lizzie, when you look at, it, she always looks like she's her strike rate is so high. It looks like what she's is struggling. Happening but now? Well, they, they're just in front of us. They're coming in for the portage. Yes. Renata's moved out to the right to make a, a burst for the portage. She's quite clever here. She's got Alberti between her and Lizzie, and it's Lizzie she fears most. So Lizzie's got to make a big effort to get across. Alberti's caught for speed. Yeah. You know Lizzie's got... <laughs> it's, it's amazing, it's, uh, amazingly skillful uh, down uh, from Renata. She knows that, that Lizzie uh, needs to, f to follow. So, so she went out on the far right-hand side, forced Lizzie to go, go right, and in the middle was Alberti. That was uh, forced, forced to back off a little bit. That, uh, very, very skillful. That was excellent yeah. to watch. Fantastic. That, that is someone who knew exactly what she was doing. She had a main opponent, yeah. a whole position away, and took advantage yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, So, yeah, no, watch, we'll see. watch and learn. You know, that, <laughs> that, that's someone who does, who knows exactly what yes, they're doing. Yes, And to be fair, you know, in the women's racing, there's never the big group. So to learn that yeah. in that environment is, yeah, that's why she's won as many medals as she has. Yes. Watch her now. Running very, very smoothly, but fast across the portage. Good drink. Good drink system by the Great Britain team there. Always really well organised on that. They've done that for so many years. And these two are, could even get away here. Yes. Uh, Bertie's only just behind them and she came out just behind them on the previous portage. But that just is a big adjust each lap. And uh, Renata always do the portage very, very safe. She's not uh, rapid jumping into the boat. She's always doing it uh, very safe. No mistakes there. And now they are off. This is Lizzie Broughton uh, trying to follow the flying Renate after the portage. She always set up uh, quite a high speed, but you never know. She may stop once again. I don't think so this time. She'll look, maybe take, yep, yeah, she'll look behind there. she see what damage she's done, see if that damage is enough, and she's decided it isn't. Yeah. So she's, she didn't make the break. She had a little shot at making, and there's quite a lot of relief in yes. Alberti at this yes. stage. She's thinking, you know what? It's so much easier for me to catch up yeah. when you stop than having to make me do the whole way. But, you know... Also, this Zai, was Zai skillfully does. done. She was watching and so yeah. no, the gap is not big enough. I don't do the effort now. So I'll wait till next time. Yeah, fiddling with the drink system, yeah. sorting out. Somebody else do the lead-in. I had a go. Lizzie's the same. I'm not doing it. And they know that Alberti... No one Sooner wants. or later, yeah. Alberti will take this lead again, won't yes. she? Because she's happy in that position. <laughs> She's looking, looking behind. behind as well. Where are they? I want to secure the, my my medal. Yeah. I can't let them go. But you think oh, of the close. three of them, probably Alberti has the most fear of the group behind yes, catching yes, up. Yes. So it will always be Alberti that yeah. ends up doing the leading. Yeah. The other two are more confident. They've got maybe a little bit more recent history. And uh, yeah, it will always fall to Alberti today. And Alberti is swearing inside her head now. <laughs> she she's forced to to go harder. She just has less choices than yeah. the than the other two, and it's interesting to see that play out. Second because group in. It, it's so cruel almost because each time a move is made, it's made to damage her. Yes. And then if it doesn't work, having tried to damage her, they then expect her to do the work, mm. and that that scenario is going to play out more than once. Fail amp and the full doom. Berenike Fuldum and also Vilas, Nuria Vilas from Spain. They're all moving well on the portage still. We'll see Two girls we're... on the same side running together. Spanish girl the, cleverly backed off. We got the graphics up now. We could see the time gap. Lamp, nice and tidy and away well. But yeah, you're looking at a two, 
two and a half minute gap to the front yeah. group now. Misko is uh, keeping up. She's, she's yeah, keeping that gap the same. Yeah. So she's uh, she's strong. doing quite well. Yes, it's uh, tough to be there all alone. And a minute, a minute looks a long way on the water, doesn't yes. it? It's uh, you know, it's a gap you can't close quickly. It's 250 meters. Yeah. If you're going to close it at all, it's going to close very, very slowly. Yes. But it's those moments where the three girls stop and they have that discussion mm. about who's going to lead. That's five seconds that you don't yeah. have to catch up mm. by paddling. It's so those those times are great news. When you see that, when you're behind, you think, yes, that's another five seconds I don't need to paddle, and uh, it's it all adds into your mental state. And strength uh, comes and goes during uh, the long races and in the certain stages you feel strong and could go, go very hard and confident and then it could disappear a bit on other stages when you have fallen off. Mental highs and lows are definitely a feature of marathon racing. Oh yeah. We, we've got in sight now, I don't, you, here we go, we're on screen now, so there's been another break in the C1. It's Barros who's paid the price for whatever mistake he made, and it's Kova leading, followed by Mosquera. They are maybe 20, well, 10 seconds ahead of Barros, maybe a little more, and the Russians have fallen back another 20, 30 seconds behind that. But two guys at the front, that's Kova and Mosquera, and they're going to be coming into the next portage in just about a minute's time. We saw um, Barros uh, watching uh, behind uh, previously. Uh, so uh, maybe he felt a little bit tired already after the first the first portage. This very, very experienced uh, Portuguese C1 paddler who, who has all, also done uh, lots of uh, Good sprint racing. Unfortunately, we are not able to give you the track records of that because we are lacking internet totally here. So what we have here is what we have in our 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 poor heads. What's amazing about our heads, Stefan, though, is that we can make up stuff that sounds quite believable sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> people out there has the internet to to, uh, to check up on us yeah but if we say anything with enough conviction maybe they wouldn't even check yeah <laughs> so the two leading c1s out the boats it's, it's a little bit easier getting out the c1s you're already halfway up you're kneeling up you haven't got to stand up but the barros is going to get a little bit hassled by the two trailing female k1s and it's Cicali. in front of him it is sikali she's still she's still going around well, that's Impressive in some ways and maybe yes. questionable in others. They're all out fairly cleanly, just as the other two are getting in at the other end. So there's Kova stepping in neatly, followed by Mosquera. <coughs> Whether they'll decide to make a break at this stage from. Or Kova will try and make a break. I, I wouldn't think so. There's still a long way to go. Yeah, so Carly's still running through the portages. It's, it's it's strange to see. Even stranger though that she's let the C1s come past her and not sit wide on the wash and mm. and make use of them while while they're there. We have seen her doing uh, some very good races, but usually when she uh, have a bad day, she used to pull out and save strength for K2. We'll see what happens. She, maybe she just wants a couple of kilometers in, into her body uh, before the K2 tomorrow. It's a graphic of all the C1s up to date. Already 25 seconds between uh, Mosquera and Barros then. As everyone goes, makes their way up the course. 
Mosquera was uh, Mosquera was uh, fourth in the World Championships <laughs> last year when Ma- Martin Kova was uh, second, Nunebaro third, and Mosquera fourth. So we'll have to enjoy the view for a little bit, and if we look straight ahead of us, there's a, a bear patch on the top of the mountain that's otherwise covered with trees, and it's a launch site for the paragliders, and there's five up there now just milling around in the thermals. And uh, can you imagine the view from up there when it's this good down here? Must be, must be amazing. And last year they were flying uh, over over the lake, and one of them uh, tumbled down right into the water, you know, just in front of us. To a big cheer from the crowd, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that that just looks phenomenal. There's there's five of them up there, just clearly circling in what must be a thermal updraft, and they're, they're just having fun, aren't they? Yeah. And they are landing on the grass fields just b- behind the venue here. A beautiful uh, alp uh, grass field with lots of flowers and it's really, really beautiful. The whole uh, Buchin Valley is fantastic. It's like to, uh, moving 40 years back in time and uh, having all this sound of music uh, views and, and exactly uh, right, yeah. And fields and flowers and clothing and everything. Really, really nice. Yeah, that's a great description. The sound of music one that gives you yeah. the, that gives you a fairly accurate picture of what we're sitting looking at. Looking at tree-covered mountains. In fact, I learned an interesting fact yesterday. Just just um, west of here, there's an area that's been deforestation and it's now just stone, and the trees were taken from there to make the foundations for Venice. Okay. Mm. And I think Cusk or something they called the area. I might be wrong on that, but somebody can check on the internet. But I mean well when I make my mistakes. But yeah, the trees are taken from there, and that forms the foundation of the floating city of Venice. In oh, oh, there's, there's quite a lot of interest around here. On the hills, mountains behind us, there's an old World War One hospital. A lot of the casualties were brought through Slovenia, treated in the mountains, on their way back to a bit of safety and security behind the lines. And there's there's an awful lot of history in a place like this. It is an awful lot of uh, great views. It's a great area for hike, hiking as well, and mountain climbing. The second group of girls in shot there, still just making their way around the course. Faldum, Lamp, and. Lost my notes for the other one. It's the Spanish. Villas. Spaniel. Villas. Nuria Villas. They're going to have to settle for, at the moment, uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh will come from that group. And there's the graphic showing you just how far that gap's opening up. They're into the three minutes now behind that lead group. There's only two, two and a half, I think, last time we had a graphic. Um, so that, that gap's just opening up and opening up. Thanks primarily to Alberti, who just keeps pressing on. She's been pressing on since the start. She knows now that she's going to get a medal. Well, we say she know now. She knows she's going to get a medal. What happened to the... Polish K2 earlier today. They yeah. they were also secure in their medal, but a, a foolish, careless mistake. All of a sudden, it's game over for them. So they're in the far distance. You can just about make them out from the commentary box. View of the crowds there. Nice setting for the crowds. Nice little bar run by the local canoe club and coffee shop also run by the local canoe club. All funds are going to them. A few of the big manufacturers are here. Nello are here with their tent, as always, repairing boats for athletes, providing the service that they're famous for. Sastra is here and a lot of other uh, boat builders as well. Trying to look into uh, 
the track records of the athletes. I see that Berenike Fuldum had her first gold medal in the World Championships already 2004, together with Linda Benedek from Hungary in the World Championships in Bergen uh, 2004, 11 years ago. Quite impressive. I say there's a long career to be had in this if you choose to have it. And in 2007, in the World Championships in Hungary, uh, Renata Shea and Berenike Faldum were second in K2 uh, behind Anne Lolk and Henriette Hansen, one of these famous Danish K2s that um, have been present on, on the marathon courses throughout the years. See so ones there. Making their journey round. Starting to plan. Each one of those will be starting to plan what they think they might or might not be able to do to each other. Come the closing stages, they'll be weighing each other up. What speed can they go? How well they portage? Where the other's weaknesses? And try and avoid their strengths. So Kova and Mosquera, first and second, almost certainly in the men's C1. Good day for them and the, the women are just coming into sight for us. They've got about two minutes to go to the turn and then another minute to the portage from there. And maybe we'll see Renata pull the same move again. I mean, they're going to be in the same positions, aren't they, this time? Yes. Alberti will be leading. Renata's got the buffer of Alberti between her and Lizzie Broughton. And if she moves wide, Lizzie has to cover that. She has to first overtake Alberti and then move across to Zai. And that can be done every lap really, yes. from now. It yes. And Renata is uh, managing her position exactly the same way as the previous lap. She knows she's, she's strong enough to be on the inside. She don't fear to be squeezed around the turn which is not it's more in youngsters race and uh, an unexperienced uh, paddler race racing where people are squeezed it's no idea to cause crashes the worst things that can happen during a marathon race is uh, close contact and then a crash it just destroys for everyone and it's, uh, it's such a gamble as well uh, if you crash into someone on purpose it's only 50-50 Yes. as to whether you come yes. off worse or they come off worse and uh, let's see what Renata does here exactly, exactly the, same. the same but Lizzie's seen it coming this time yes. so she's moved up much sooner she's learned from last time Alberti just caught for speed but Lizzie still has to get across and you see Renata yeah. she's moving away and away and yeah, away yeah, from yeah. it she has to come back in at some stage <laughs> because the portage is coming but for now and Alberti is falling off exactly the same way as the yeah. previous lap. So it's the same pattern, and this pattern will probably happen every lap. Yes. Assuming yes. that Alberti can catch up after each yeah. portage. But yeah. Lizzie's fairly confident there. She hasn't moved across to her. She's no. matching her side, yes. side by side. And she, she was a little bit uh, scared last, uh, yeah. last time. Last time there was more panic. This time she's yeah. just decided to match her stroke for stroke. Both girls will be aware that that's happening. Only, yeah. only the individual themselves knows exactly how hard they're trying there. Yeah. It seems like Renata is. Putting, Renata looks putting a little in, more relaxed. Yeah, putting in just enough effort yeah. to to create the position she wants. Just to make Lizzie yeah. do some work. Yeah. And now, oh, that was a poor, uh, poor just bit from of water Alberti. maybe in the front of the boat. Yes. She got stuck and lost uh, second maybe. That could be a little bit decisive if uh, the other two decides to go. So Melvin Swallow on the drinks there. Melvin, of course, won the Masters racing a, a, probably a hundred times by now. Yeah, and Renate, um, don't take any drinks. I think she has a maybe a drink in the boat. Yeah. Second lap, she doesn't take any drinks at all. I've seen her doing that many times before as well. She uh, usually says that uh, she don't think uh, these marathon races are fairly long. She, it's just just so another she, this go. This is this is a more oh, serious yeah. effort. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. 
she are she is very well aware that uh, Alberti lost some ground in the in the entrance of the portage. Exactly no. the same will happen though. She'll take a look after another 10 seconds maybe. Yeah. See if the damage is enough, and then she'll either put her paddles down and let Lizzie take it, or she'll press on. There's the look. She's have a look. And she's carrying on this time. Yes. So she fancies her chances of making this break permanent. <laughs> it's so nice to see how skillful, how skillful she is. So, yeah. so she thinks it through. Yeah. It's beautiful to watch. Yes. So she she's going to make this break permanent. Yeah, well, Second quick comes, look, make sure yeah. it's working. And she's confident that it is. She's going to take it all yeah. away. It is. She uh, really increased the speed a little bit after that look. And the third one. Uh, now that now the looks are to make sure the gap is big enough so that she can allow Lizzie to yes, take the lead. Yes, exactly, exactly. So she was watching Lizzie. Where is Lizzie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Making, exactly so. Making and sure. Now Lizzie, Lizzie is aware of it, and now she's heading. This is great marathon paddling. So Lizzie knows her job here. She has to work harder than she wants to, to re to increase that gap. Mm. Then Renata will do maybe one more really tough lead, and yes. that, that elastic to the third person is broken. Renata is watching once again and see if the yep. gap is increasing, and she will stay there until uh, it's a risk that it is uh, closing again, and then she she will do another big effort and try to tire the others out. I think she's moving now. She probably, yes. yeah, she's set off yep. again. Yep. And they'll do two or three of those until the elastic snaps between well, them and the attack. Watch uh, Alberti now. She's catching uh, the V Bosch uh, far behind there. You can see it clearly on the on the screen. She has not given up. She's uh, catching the wash uh, on uh, on the side, far left hand side of the flying two in front. She's moved out. She's rolling down those waves. That plan only goes wrong when they have to come in for the turn yeah. at the end. Yeah. So she's got all the way to that top turn, which is quite a long way to make her way up to those girls. Yeah. And they're still pressing on there. Lizzie's turn again. Go, 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 sister. Yeah. Go, go, go for it now. <laughs> and Lizzie Lizzie accepts that it's her turn. Yes. This is this is a joint effort to get rid of somebody else here. And it's a little bit more distance than the, uh, the impression now on the screen. Alberti's come in, tucked in behind them. Instead of being out wide, maybe she's even coming to the right now. But those two girls, you think? I think when the camera angle gives us a true shot of distance, that gap will be a little bit bigger. Alberti starts watching uh, her back now two times in a short while. That uh, tells that she's a little bit scared and she's tire tiring out a bit. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, that that's a whole scenario played out as exactly how it should be. Yes. And, like a school book in yeah. marathon paddling. Uh, and when did that start? That came from the turn before the portage when Renata Zay moved yeah. out made Lizzie do her work, knew that Alberti would be the one who suffered, and absolutely thought through, well thought through. Back, okay. back to the second group. It's The gap is... Um got news, news coming through from the external people that somebody's got a timeout in the penalty box. I really hope it isn't either of the two leaders. I don't see why it should no. be. But apparently, there is a timeout for somebody. Um, if we get any news of that, any concrete news, of course, we'll tell you. And uh, maybe Stefan can inform us he was listening better to the information coming in. I was getting it kind of secondhand. Is, was there a timeout? Yes, coming a timeout uh, coming up uh, within half an hour or so uh, for the internet. We have great problems with the internet uh, provision here. Uh, we don't have enough enough band bro band bandwidth to uh, play with, uh, and that's why <coughs> why our commentary is uh, 30 seconds behind the, the what you're seeing on the screen. We are we are, have been trying to manage that uh, over the days, but uh, it seems impossible just because uh, lack of bandwidth. There is not uh, bandwidth enough in the Bohin Valley for for running this. That's uh, apparent. I guess that's one of the drawbacks of a venue of this nature. I mean, uh, as beautiful as it is in terms of the technical input, we're just a bit limited. So uh, I'm, I misunderstood all the timeout messages that were coming in from outside. I took it to mean that somebody had a penalty standout. So I've just badly informed the public there. So there is no penalty standout for any of the athletes. It was a timeout in our broadband and it will be conditions normal 
nothing to fear. I was worried that one of the leading girls had got a timeout on okay. on the course. Oh, that's it. It's still uh, a lot for for organizers to learn, uh, creating a more modern uh, modern sport. Uh, we have been uh, working with this uh, internet uh, thing for uh, for a month now, but. Uh, still not enough bandwidth to to play with uh, running this event professionally that's a shame it's, it's really interesting from from this side of the mic again that the tv crew running this are massively professional they've got everything yes. under control they uh, they're on the case everything everything is working and it's just that outlet that they have they haven't got the, the internet stream to to get everything out and it, it's so well run here. It's it's really great to see from the inside, honestly, guys. For you guys watching, who I know will be upset by the fact that everything isn't running as smoothly as it should, the effort that's gone into it is really quite eye-opening for somebody who's in it for the first time. So yeah, a, a lot of support would be welcome. Um, really, this will get better and better. I mean, the next next thing's in Germany, is it the World Cup? Yes. And I'm sure. With better German efficiency, the internet will be fine. And then, of course, we've got Hungary World Championships in September, and the Hungarians, with it being one of their national sports, it will be well organised there as well. And maybe just a, we'll use this one as a practice for our banter in the commentary box and uh, deciding what you, as the public, with a bit of feedback, obviously, on the internet, what what you want to hear for next time, information you need to know stuff you want mentioned you just tell us what you want and it will be made right for the next event absolutely absolutely so it will take uh, some time for um, for the organizers to uh, to learn uh, when you organize such an event it's uh, one one time story it's fire and forgot forgot so they are experienced when the event is over uh, so they they learn during the event and that's always a, a slight problem for us traveling around to all, the, all these events some things you can manage uh, some things is entirely with the organizers and the internet is uh, of course one such thing so on screen there we had a very dejected Barros and now we're up to the, the women's leaders and there's the gap it's not it's not unassailable that no. gap it's still only maybe 15 seconds 20 seconds and uh, which, now, which now leaves the two front runners with a problem do they keep g g doing and doing and doing or do they let her catch up they know they can out sprint her at the end anyway so why not have her there anyway and just use her to get you around the rest mm -hmm. of the course maybe that gap isn't big enough to make it permanent and it's just another stress you have to mm -hmm. wonder whether she's coming mm -hmm. maybe a change of plan again but uh, whatever plan Renato Zai has it will be the right plan for her we've Absolutely. seen her do everything right for her and uh, so whatever decision she makes it was interesting one of the uh, events I think it was in Krestuma where she was uh, heading from the start and her lead was uh, up to I think th three minutes at one, one stage of the race and she told me after the race that uh, she the fear she had uh, during the race, not knowing exactly how, how far away the other was, was a great motivation, but also very, very stressful. She didn't really directly after the race uh, like the race. Uh, she, she, she said it was just terrible, not not knowing if they were catching the, catching on her or or losing. I guess uh, that's one of the benefits for of these short lap courses because you can always see them when you go around the turns. Absolutely, you see them every every five minutes. Probably yes. you can gauge how well yes. you're doing and also but, if uh, you have a very good support crew like in cross-country skiing they are very used to that and they have yeah. a support crew every kilometer or so telling all the back times but it's yeah, interesting but they use the word fear okay i'm sure that the lesser athletes look at renata's eye and they don't see fear no that's no. not the picture no, they no. see no no and and when you're out there and you're racing people like this you have fear of your race but you have to understand that even at the top those people are equally scared they may sure. be scared of different things, but the fear is there. That fear never goes away. And I remember lining up for a walking to the start for one of the races. And I think it was Alan Laws. He's been around the British canoe team forever. And he said something to me like, it's okay for you. You'll be all right. And I thought, man, I'm as scared as anyone else. 
absolutely scared as anywhere else. And, and, and you need that fear to mm. perform as well. You can't perform if you're not scared. But it, it, it's very evident that when people look at the, the, the top end guys, they don't see the fear mm. that those people feel. Some athletes. Uh, the, the, the thing is to to um, twist that fear into something positive. Uh, not not feeling nervousness uh, that much so that you can't pedal. Uh, so to twist that uh, fear into something positive is the thing to do. Yeah, and almost you know you talk about Renata being ahead of the field and not knowing where they were. Yeah. She almost creates that monster behind her. Sure. Because without the monster behind you, there's nothing to drive you on. So exactly. the fear is almost self-induced so that she can have enough motivation to keep mm. going when things get tough. Mm. So fear, you need to see fear as almost a positive, mm. really, rather than... Is this the second group broken down? We've lost Faldum yep. from this second group. Yeah, Faylamp and... Uh, and um, Villas. So that sort of pace, you, you can't imagine them paddling away from Feldham, but maybe maybe we, there was something we didn't pick up with the cameras, or actually we have we have no proof that she's not in front of them. To be fair, oh, well, that's right. <laughs> this turning point is uh, two kilometers away from here, and we can hardly see who, who is who um, live. We are as stuck to the camera view as you are. There they are. No Feldum. So no Feldum in front of them, so she's behind. It's four minutes now. Wow, that, minutes. that gap is opening up so quickly. We yeah. commented last time that it had grown to three minutes yes. and now now up to four. And that part of that would be that Shy and Broughton had to do that big yes. effort to drop. Yes. So but it seems like uh, they gain a minute a lap. Yeah. Something like that. Which is a lot. A you know, lot. On, a lot. On athletes of this class anyway. Mm. A lap is about four kilometers and a minute a lap will make 15 se seconds a kilometer, every, which yeah, is huge. huge yeah. So another overview of the lake there. Quick, <laughs> Very quick scan round. They found someone. Someone who's lacking a bit of motivation by the look of it. Yeah. Having a nice afternoon paddle on the Great Lake. Looking around. I'm trying to see where he is. He must be oh, he's just out to our left. About a minute to go. Well, that be two minutes to go to the next turn. Here we are, back to the leaders. They're also in no rush anymore. Having a bit of downtime. It's closing in towards the end of the race. Uh, I have to confess, I've lost track of laps again, as I do in actually every single race, Stefan. Me too. <laughs> we are like seagulls. Uh, one too many. That's the way they count. We we'll listen with Jim Rossiter, who is the most experienced commentator in the world, and he always keeps track of these things. And we just had a message from Brian Chapman. They're currently on lap five. Brian Chapman is uh, the advisor to the television producer. So it's Brian who picks uh, the, the right views from the cameras. It is four cameras along the course. Some of them connected via uh, fiber optics uh, into the water to the camera positions uh, that are out there on the course. That is uh, something new. Uh, we used it back in '96 in Vaxholm, that te technology. Uh, over 20 kilometers of fiber, fiber optics in the bottom. Uh, but since then, uh, this is the first time we, we do that. That is similar to cross country skiing, where they have uh, maybe tens of kilometers of fiber optics uh, throughout the terrain to cover all, all these uh, places where the camera stands. It's okay, so opposite us now, coming into that last turn before the portage. We've got the women's K1. It's Lizzie Broughton from uh, Renata Say, But th that gap has not broken, has no, it? Between no, it has not. 
them and Alberti. She's maybe 10, 11 seconds behind still as the last graphic had us. Lizzie and uh, Renata still trading leads. It's Renata's turn now and again she's pressing on. So they're pressing on now. Alberti, yeah. you have to admire that. that she's Absolutely. Alberti is matching doing the two a, of them. Yeah, Alberti is doing a great, a great race. It's very nice to see her back, uh, back in top. Uh, it was a couple of years since, but now she's really there once again. So you got the front two on screen. You can see how much effort's going in there. They're not hanging about. There's Alberti. It's very hard to tell distances head on yes. there, but that's about yeah, you know, maybe it's less than 15 seconds. I'd yes, say. Yes, it is. It is. And uh, amazing. And so much plays with your mind then every time the two in front of you change leads you start to feel sorry for yourself because yeah. you think oh they've just been resting and now they're going and if you if you do manage to close five seconds and the lead changes and it opens up again that same five seconds it's so soul destroying but and they the moment they they start to quarrel, quarrel of who shall have the lead in front Alberti will catch them yeah that, it's not a safe gap. I mean, if no. these two just start to fight over who's going to win rather than who's helping each other to get away, then that gap can close very, very quickly. Yes. So front two, both out of the oh, boats. Oh, so mm. nicely jumping out the Renata's boat. Renata's so, yeah. so smooth. So and controlled. Lizzie a little bit more haphazard on that one. You can see how Renata balances uh, her boat so, so nicely. It is some always some water in the boat and, and it's in the back. Now... But she's uh, saving the rudder. She's doing an effort now, as it seems. She is, she's, that's a, a serious run she's just done, isn't it? Yes. Photographer in the oh, water. Wow. You've got to be impressed by a photographer that's up to his neck in it, surely. She has created she's, a, this a could small be, gap for herself. Yeah, this now could we'll be... Uh, wow, what's this? Whoa. Okay. So Lizzie looking behind rather than in front, not encouraging. So I think, uh, it's a shame uh, we didn't see what really happened there. Lizzie, oh, well, she, she has given up yep. this now. Renata is flying. Once oh, again, fuck. Renata Shea in splendid isolation. She is really flying now. She has created the gap she wanted, exactly the position she wants. We have seen it uh, doing the, this many, many, many times throughout the years. She had some problems last year uh, creating this gap, and it was a close in finish. But today, she is back again in the, the same old shape that we are used to see her throughout the years. Look at that. Just it's from nothing. It's amazing. From, from nothing. nothing. They were they into, the into the porches yeah, together. together. And now it's... It must be 20 seconds now. It's uh, absolutely amazing. Yeah. But Lizzie knew as soon as she got away, she yes. knew she didn't have the strength yes. to catch her. She, immediately she looked back to see where yeah. the rescue would come yeah. from rather yeah. than... <laughs> but the rescue, uh, yeah, that was very, uh, very well said. <laughs> it's... Uh, I know that that will pan out now. Those two will be an interesting race. I yes, mean, they're both tired. They've yeah. both done a lot of work. Yes, Lizzie uh, did a lot of work on that last lap yes. to try and make the break. And I think I think they have totally given up every thought thought of, thought yeah. of uh, yeah. catching Renate. Renate once now is again in it's that same absolutely position. impressive. The queen of marathon paddling. Yeah, what did, what do you have to do? Yeah, to 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 match that, you know. You see, you see at the European 5K that there are people who can match her with speed. You can see that they can leave her behind at the start. There's no one who could leave her far enough behind at the start to stop her catching up on a race exactly. this length. But maybe if you're that fast, maybe one of the top 5K girls. You know, we've got a couple in, in the UK. We've got Louisa Sawyers. We've got uh, Lani Belcher. Yeah. Maybe if one of those could stay with her through the... The, the journey yeah. itself they but could challenge her at the end but they've got to stay with her for the journey and you yes. haven't seen anyone do that for exactly, a long time exactly I think it's two things uh, with Renate it's uh, the technique she's paddling so relaxed and using her hips it's, she's not a big girl uh, using the hips and the back and the stomach a lot uh, very very good technique um, and then uh, she uh, has what do you say proper English uh, good uh, oxygen motor yeah, she's engine got, yeah well just, yeah just a good engine I mean she's a uh, good engine she's yes got I think uh, 
she's similar to Suzanne Gunnarsson there. She her engine was also excellent. Uh, she won the races because of a very good engine. She was a really good cross cross country skier as well and did a lot of endurance training. Hugely, a lot lots 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 of kilometers of cross-country skiing between 50 and 60 kilometers a day during wow. during winter time in cross-country skiing with which brought her to the top 10 cross-country skiers uh, also uh, so to have a great engine will be necessary to beat Renate absolutely yeah the, if you're paddling behind that and she's paddling with that sort of rhythm that sort of strength the feeling of hopelessness yeah. must be just all, all consuming you just yeah. think yeah what, what am i going to do yeah. with that what can i do yeah it's, it's disappointing for a great britain point of view that lizzie couldn't stay there this year she did last year she stayed there right yes. to the end renata tried a couple of times yes. but couldn't get rid of her mm. and to to fall back again this year it's a little bit but yeah I say Lizzie did the devices to Westminster. It's 125 miles. Yeah. It's, oh. it's 18 hours, and it's oh. it's at Easter. So you know that that changes some things about you, and it, it certainly changes the training you're doing around that area. So maybe by September she's come up this far. Yeah. Maybe by September she can match her again. Mm. And yeah, you know, I'm going to pin my hopes on that because Lizzie has done so so well. And she's not inside the system that gets any assistance. She's not training with the good girls. She trains by herself or with her group at Richmond Canoe Club. And she's, she's, she's hardcore. She's, not a, she's certainly not someone who gives up. You'll see them in the K2 tomorrow. Let's hope they have better fortune in that. But, uh, and she loves uh, canoeing. And she enjoys it. Yes. You know? And enjoyment is key. Mm. You, know, you, can't, you can't sustain a sports career if you're not enjoying it. <laughs> She told me once to, that the benefit of marathon was that uh, you were ought to be on the water much longer than the sprinters. Right. And she okay. loved that. Just loves being out <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah. That's Sam Plummer giving Faye Lamp a drink. Sam had a great day yesterday in the under 23s. Both our boys did. I was really proud of them yesterday. And now he's helping out the rest of his teammates, giving them drinks. And there's a man. Well, look, look, what not many people know about that photographer is he's, his top half is man, but the bottom half is actually seal. <laughs> and he, he lives in the water around the edges of this lake. He is one of the local urban uh, um, area the myths. Gold, the gold monster of this he, valley? No, but he does go to the past same parties as the gold okay, monster. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Half man, half fish. Yeah. That's very unusual. But that's, that's how life is in places like this. Because... Uh, Precisely like the Norwegian fjords. This is very similar to Norwegian fjords. They have a gold monster here, as uh, the Norway Norwegians have their trolls. The monsters of the, the monsters woods of death. myth. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So that's uh, second group now. Somewhere in between that. Is a Hungarian who's making her way, her journey all by herself. So now we've got Renata Zay out on her own. Really, really job job done. It's just a matter of time now before she finishes. Behind her, we've got Alberti and Broughton. Behind them, got the Hungarian all by herself, as she has been for so much of this race. But. Uh, Oh, just it's, it's just class, isn't it? You you watch that, and it's just class. Paddling nicely, strong, good form, same form she had from the start, and she'll finish with that same form. There's no breakdown there at all. Boat. Notice how as she pulls, the boat lifts in the water. It lifts each time she pulls. She's got good downforce on the paddles, driving with her legs, pushing through the hips. Great control of the top arm, top shoulder. And there we are treated to a close up view of arguably the best female canoeist in history. But that is a really open debate. I'm sure both Susanna Gunnarsson and Anna Hemmings would have an opinion on that.
Yeah, it's checking behind every now and then, but really, she knows it's over. She's just interested to see how well she's doing, really. So Stefan's just gone to check, get confirmation of how many laps are left. I'm sure you guys know that out there. But uh, it's very hard to keep track of when you're doing the two races and sat here with that only a limited view of what's going on. Back to the leaders in the C1 race, Martin Kova and David Mosquera, Hungary, Spain, always hungry in Spain, hungry in Spain, hungry in Spain, Portugal sometimes nip in with a, a result in the C1, but the consistent teams are hungry and Spain, a little stop for your drink system, and a match, now you see that a lot. Hungarian guy stopped for his drink, not because he necessarily wanted a drink, but because he wanted the Spanish guy to take over. At which point, the Spanish guy doesn't want to, so he also reaches for his drink. Then they come to an understanding, and it is in fact the Spanish guy who takes on the lead. So Stefan hopefully has come back with the information on how many laps left. Of course, uh, this is the sixth port portage. So we have uh, two more full laps to go. Coming into the portage now, Sakali still trawling around the course. Joined by a couple of C1s, we've caught them up. They're not the first C1s to overtake and catch them, obviously. Stefania Cicali that had a bronze medal, a, a silver medal actually in Rome in K1. No, a bronze medal in Rome in K1 and a silver medal in K2 in Rome, they were in the World Championships in Rome, 2012. She was third uh, last year. And of course she have, have had the uh, before Rome, several good results as an under-23 and junior as well. As have the Italians over the years. We had Intrioni way back yes. in the past. Yes. And they, they, they've consistently produced top-end marathon paddlers. Which they haven't ever really managed to do in the, in the men's. Okay, so here we go. We're going to have to fess up to another hideous uh, <laughs> error on the uh, commentary. The athlete we've been referring to as Sakali all along is in a very similar boat, very similar colours. That's our excuse at least, but it's actually the Czech paddler. Lenka Krochova. So apologies for that. Uh, we're on a learning curve. I think we curve. were right uh, until uh, the this lap and the previous lap, uh, Lenka Khrukhova, uh, boat number 459, is the, is the one that is down there now. That we refer to as uh, Shikali. Maybe Shikali pulled out uh, just after we thought so, and then uh, after that uh, third, fourth lap or something like that, uh, Lenka Khrukhova, very similar dress and a very similar boat. Lenka Krokova from Czech Republic uh, that has also done a lot of good racing over the years. Um, she finished nine uh, last year at the Europeans and many other good results over the years. See the Croatian C1 with his drink bottle fixed in his boat there. Rather than taking on a bottle over his or a bag over his neck on each lap. That way you know you've got it with you at all times, there's no room for error on that. So it's a safer way of doing it, but you're carrying around a couple of kilos of liquid in the early days. So that's the downside. 
That was actually the way I chose to race. I always had a fixed bottle in my boat. I knew exactly how much liquid was in it. And very rarely did I take on anything at the portages. And uh, that suited me. I, I, I knew I was comfortable with that system. And that's the most important thing, that you're comfortable with whatever system you're using. We did the same, many of us, uh, during that period, but then when the portages started to be l uh, longer and longer in the classic races and you need to, to uh, run quickly, that was impossible. So we developed the system, uh, actually a Swedish uh, development of the system of uh, small plastic drinking bags um, that we got from the hospitals actually and um, invented as uh, the drinking system that that uh, almost everyone uses nowadays. The disadvantage back day th then was that the uh, races um, were on very very long distances so the support crew, crew needed to, to uh, travel a lot or we needed many guys standing on different uh, stages across uh, the 42 kilometer long course or as in Brisbane 48 kilometers. Again on screen there you saw the leading athlete stop yeah. for her drink really to get Faye Lamb to overtake her and take the lead. Faye didn't want to do it. She took her drink as well. And then in despair, they carried on as they were before with the Spanish athlete leading Faye. Now they both hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> or at least the Spanish Poor girl hate, hates yeah. Faye for at least the next half a minute. She's angry with her, but they know they need to finish the race. So they'll work that out. A couple of back markers in the C1 race coming into the portage now. Italian on the right and the Czech guy who was also in the under 23s yesterday. That's uh, for Jan De Luis is the Czech guy. And for Italy, we are looking at Mirko Da. Mirko Da, that I've haven't seen before on these courses could be a memory gap of course but I think he's quite new into international marathon racing just behind them the Croatian Bruno Kumpes maybe about 30 seconds behind he's got a view of their backs but just in front of us now coming around the turn into the portage Renate Che just moving so well it's now got about oh, 30 40 seconds maybe maybe even more than that actually, yeah, a minute. maybe a minute yeah um, she knows her job's done she's just got to find a tempo and a pace that works for her she won't be working at, at her limit anymore she'll be oh. comfortable and confident I mean there's so much confidence isn't there you've just paddled away from your two main competitors still have um Two full laps, laps to go, coming into the her sixth portage. So another full lap. Ah, uh, one and a half then. Yeah, one yeah. more full lap and then the uh, short yeah. lap. Yeah. But it's amazing how easy it feels when you're ahead like that. Yes. When you know the other people are beaten. Yeah. Then every paddle stroke's under control. Everything feels easy. Everything. Everything seems cheerful at that and stage. Hopefully someone is telling her now uh, how much uh, is the gap backwards. So, so she can safely continue this road. She's aware she's going to race doubles tomorrow. Yeah. Um, she's not going to go into any sort of energy debt here, is she? She's going to just let this race pan out now. Very nice and smooth. As she has been on every single port, each one looks exactly the same, yes, right? It's yes. the same routine every time she approaches. Up, out of the boat. Just behind uh, Lizzie and Alberti, side by side. Lizzie coming right on the portage this time. Is it worth trying to make a break at this stage? Or just leave it to the last mm. portage for either of these two? They should, I think. Help, helping each other. Yeah. yeah. Lizzie's coming in with some intent there. It looks like she still is trying to to get us, create herself a gap. 
Maybe she hasn't got any help uh, doing the hard work yeah. in front, so... Well, we see now, Bertie, she's got outlast on every portage. Yes. But she runs well and she gets in within contact of the other girls each time. So, a little bit of feeding, maybe. Comes Melvin straight over the head. Never a mistake from Melvin. Yeah, totally reliable. And that means so much to you as an athlete that there's someone reliable there for you. There's going to be no gap created there. No. It will be interesting to hear in the interview later on uh, how, how their thinking have been uh, throughout the race. Yeah, I mean, they've both had changes of mind, haven't they? Yes. They've had, and had to readjust their plan to yes. suit the situation they're in. It's 49, 50 second gap. It looks bigger than that on the water, doesn't it? Yes. They look so far behind now. But 49 seconds is 200 meters, so. Yeah, it's uh, it's a long way. Those two are off. They're going to work presumably together for one more lap, and then it's everything to play for on the last portage. They're so equally matched on those portages, aren't they? Yes. That it will be. It'll be really interesting to see how this race pans out at the end. I know, you know they're both going to go home happy with a medal. Absolutely so. They each know where they are in their program for the year. Mm. You know, it, for me, I'm a little bit disappointed for Lizzie, but she may know that where her training's going. I don't, I don't know what training she's doing at the moment. I think she's uh, quite pleased. She knows <coughs> that uh, it's really, really hard to to beat Renate, uh, it could be done, and some sometime, someone will do yeah, it. Someone yeah, will do. There's it. no one who's ever gone through no. and never been beaten. No. It, someone will beat her. If but she doesn't you, you stop have, after this, <coughs> yeah. But you have to, you have to go home. What do you do? You make a plan. You you have to work out what Renata's weaknesses are, yeah. and they're they're not many of them, are there? No. So. You, you've got to build up your strengths almost to match hers and then get one little extra bit. Maybe the, maybe the one extra bit you can get is a turn of speed. And Mishko is uh, still uh, keeping on. Quite impressive race also of her. She fell off uh, already in the first portage and uh, yeah, she has kept on going, this young Hungarian. And still moving well. Yeah, you can't see her on screen. Here she is now on screen. Uh, still paddling nicely, nice rhythm. Noemi Mishko. It's always a new, new paddler from Hungary coming up. Uh, it's impressive their, the numbers they have to pick from. Coming to support is nice and steady. Really, just to let go of your paddles there. I, I always like to have my paddles yes. in my hand. Never, yes. never put them away. It, Coming in individually, it's not a problem. But no. if there's a crowd, somebody can easily kick that paddle away from you. But it seems so, like uh, the Hungarians never practice uh, portages uh, much. It is an area of weakness yeah. for yes, a lot of them. It is. Absolutely. It is. Yeah, always, you need your paddle and you need your boat. And yeah. to lose contact with either is always a mistake. Yes. If, you, if you get out of your boat and don't leave your hand yeah. touching it, mm. it can be pushed away mm. by someone else. Or you can push it away yourself mm. with your feet as you get out. Never, ever... Uh, lose the grip of the paddle yeah. not even if you fall in yeah so yeah <laughs> that's also part part of the men, 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 mental training doing that especially if you do river races and again she's put a paddle down yes, getting in yes if if you're in a crowd that can be kicked yes, into the water yes. no no trouble at all and just have one hand on your paddle at all times but she's safe she's on her own She's just got one big lap to do. You can be sure she's counting them down. She's been counting absolutely. them down for a long time yes, now. Absolutely. There she is, four minutes behind now, and that's that's. There's another gap of, yeah, a few minutes, a couple of minutes between her and the next two. So yeah. those gaps are just opening up all the time.
So the next bit of excitement we'll have here will be uh, the C1s. They'll be coming in for their penultimate portage. They're doing exactly the same number of laps as the uh, K1 women. So next into the portage, Spain and Great Britain. Another race within a race for these two. That's 4-5-2, Bellacci with Faye Lamp. Faye's neatly out of her boat. See, as Villachi gets out there, she ends up actually facing the wrong way momentarily. She kind of rolls out the boat and faces back the way she came. Always be heading forwards in the direction you want to be travelling. But these are things that you can learn as you go along. Sam Plummer there. That's quite odd. That's, that's, Faye now has two bags around her neck. She already hadn't finished the one that she's given last time, and now she's got a second one. Maybe she has different drinks in each one. She'll know her plan. And hopefully she will have worked through that a few times. And here we get head on shot. The men see one as they come in, as it has been for so long. Martin Kova, David Musquera. Having a quick tidy up before he comes into the portage. You see how they've arranged themselves with uh, Kova on the on. They're both paddling on the inside, so steering that that might be deliberate. Maybe we can get a message from one of the people who know C1. Is it easier to wash hang with your paddle the same side as the paddle you're wash hanging? Please send me a Facebook message. Maybe Richard Crooks could do that for me. He was my previous informant for the junior women's C1. Gave me some good information there. Is it easier to wash hang on the paddle side? of a boat when you're paddling C1. Neatly up and away, both of them. Look at that, that's very tidy. Little slip there from Mosquera, but nothing that's gonna damage his chances on this portage. It's not too crucial. It's the next one where everything will come to a head. Water over his head and, <laughs> and some down his front. Is there some comedy in that, isn't there? The way they're being, uh, the Hungarian support crew throwing water at their yeah. athletes. It's its almost a little bit like the old, I don't know if you had it all throughout Europe, I think you did the It's a Knockout competition where, yeah. where people are throwing water <laughs> over each other while they're trying to rescue a, a princess with a big pointy hat on. And there's an element of, it, of the It's a Knockout competition in these Hungarian support crew staff. So yeah, do regroup after the portage and off they go. That's be a long last lap for these two. And it will all come down some fairly narrow margins at that last portage. This might be one of the largest gaps, uh, winning gaps for uh, Renata ever. Uh, 2011, she had uh, 1 minute for 41 seconds to uh, Anna Alberti, who finished uh, second in Singapore. Uh, 2012, it was 52 seconds uh, to uh, Stefania Shikali, who were second. Uh, and in Copenhagen, uh, 2013, it was uh, 25 sec uh, It was 1 minute 8 seconds to uh, Anna Kova from Czech Republic. Last year it was just uh, two seconds actually to Lizzie Broughton and 25 seconds in, seconds in, to, in the Europeans. So she seems she seems to be back on track a little bit more than a minute it will be. And, and how many people do you know have that much luxury <laughs> of, of uh, finishing uh, uh, that many uh, times? You know, it's fantastic. It's uh, and even the 
earlier than that the gaps have been uh, about a minute yeah. many times but when you've had that gap so many times and the athletes you're racing know you have that gap that many times when that gap initially appears mm. you just have that deja vu feeling you've seen it before the gap opens up because you expect it to open up and and it, it i don't know it she has she has that power over them doesn't she it's almost like she it's got impressive some kind that of magic. she find the inspiration the motivation to to train that hard when she's so so far yeah ahead, ahead. of everyone else yeah. there's the gap there 53 seconds to alberti and broughton yeah and that will get slightly bigger what oh, can you remember what it was at the portage it was it was about that wasn't it yeah. just under the minute yeah. so it's going to be a big big finish yes big finish gap i mean when uh susan gunnarsson and anna hemmings raced uh, they were competing each other and oh. that was the motiv motivating they were fantastic yeah. races and they were close races yes and, and the, it was the motivating factors uh, for them to go on during the winter and what was really interesting with them was when when anna first came susanna was clearly better yes. than her yes. and that gap gradually closed yes. over the years to yes. a state where at the end you you really didn't know no. who was going to win and e each year that that duel got a little bit more interesting absolutely and in 96 when the susan came home from uh, the olympics in atlanta and the, the world champs in marathon was just three weeks b b after uh, she had a gold medal on 500 meters there coming home all the celebration and then the worlds and oh, it's hard to uh, regroup yes I imagine for but that. one on her home turf uh, with a couple of seconds just yeah, yeah. And that, that was you know, one of the memorable races it back was. in Vaxholm yeah. then. Again, a, lo a beautiful venue on the archipelago yeah. there. And it's uh, uh, another great... And it's on YouTube for anyone to watch. One of the first oh. races uh, on YouTube. Yeah, we had that one. And then um, the, the South African yes. 98 is also out there on YouTube yes. as well. And there's some good, good footage from that. Yes. But hopefully, over the next couple of years, we'll have good footage from all the races and the footage will increase in quality as well as quantity. And uh, we'll manage to tailor it to what you, the audience, need or want. And uh, Absolutely. And the organizers got used to the technology we are using. The technology here is quite impressive. Uh, you've got the, the technology that, that puts the on-screen times the, the intermediate times on each of the uh, turn pontoons there's a sort of what do we call it a, antenna. an antenna and they're, they're not cheap those antenna no. are they uh, it's a difficult t technology just because we are on water uh, for cross-country skiing and in the running they use the, the similar technique with ships but the antennas can be uh, under the snow or just on the ground for running uh, here we have water it's impossible to put antennas into the water and it's also in more or less impossible to build the portals out there to have antennas in the air why we need antennas uh, facing the athletes from the side and uh, then the radio frequencies is disturbed by by the water so we have actually adopted the same technology as to me measure high speed trains uh, to make this working by a company called learning well that have developed this system it's great to have that sort of input into it so essentially the technology is the same as the marathon runners when they run over the mat yes. with their chip okay same technology but and me Many people keep on telling me that uh, they have a system that works, but yes, but they have, but for skiing and cycling and everything that is not on water. Yeah. The thing here is it's on water and it's a challenge. Three year of development is now finalized and this is the first time it works really, really well. In shot there, Levanti Bala had such a great day yesterday. Maybe today was a step too far for him, moving up to the senior ranks after a you know, quite a hard race yesterday. And hard not only physically, but the mental preparation to do that twice. And of course, it was very hot out here yesterday. And uh, the heat, the sun takes its toll on everybody. Even if you are used to it, there's still a cost. And it's still very hot. I think it's... Uh about 30 or a little bit less 
out there in the water and uh, hardly no wind. We've got a very fortunate position here actually haven't we Stefan, we're slightly shaded by the trees, we're in a nice yes. white tent, it's relatively cool in here. Yeah. But we're still dressed for summer. We're of course. Sitting in our shorts and t-shirts and loving life right now. In the distance we can see ahead of us, you can't see it on screen, but uh, Renato Zay is just coming up to the final turn before the final portage. The gap is roughly a minute still, maybe, yeah, it's going to be a little bit more than a minute, I think, now. And as we watch the C1s on screen, they're still further up the course, just hitting the first of the three turns. Renata Zay comes around the third of those three turns and she's going to be headed straight towards the portage in about 20 seconds. So, fairly simple, here she is, head on shot, Renata Zay is really just a luxury little procession for her, she's just going wide there slight change of direction just to take her outside the waves from those two C1s in front of her. If she was really tired at this stage those two C1s would really be eating away at her mind there. They'd just, she'd be angry with that, that there's people in front of her, that there's waves to climb over that she doesn't need to climb over. But with the luxury cushion of a minute's lead those things certainly pale into insignificance. Nothing bothers you when you're four minutes away roughly from winning your next European gold medal. Bit of a camera pan there, but now back to the job, back to the task in hand. And now today, a few sips of uh, drink before she gets to the portage. Probably ditch that drink at the portage. Wouldn't bother to take on another. They say, but really relax now. She's not in a hurry there, is she? No, she's not. Uh this will be nice and safe for her. <laughs> Stopping, fixing her equipment, uh, letting the Plenty sea boats uh, getting out of her way. Really, really easy. She... No mistakes <laughs> here. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice to have that luxury yeah. at this oh. stage of a race this big? It's very luxury. Looks luxurious. Uh, as much as it's great watching her come through, yeah. so the queen of everything in the area just you know? jogging over the yeah. portage now she had, a, she had time so, to so fix strong. her equipment and fix herself so she can I mean, lo look good over this portage and she right. does but coming into the portage now probably slightly more serious for these two they're fighting out for second and third it's Lizzie Broughton's got the edge coming into the portage but we've seen Alberti come out the portage well a number of times this will be intense the, uh, watching Renate getting into her boat out again and now we want to watch uh, on the, also on the stream the other girls coming in, there they are. So Lizzie's cleverly pushed Alberti out. She's now got one, two, three, three second gap there. And I think uh, that move from her might have been decisive. Could be. She's running well. She won't obviously take on a drink here. She might get a bucket of water over her head. But uh, running fast, run. she's going to run right to the end of the pontoon now. She needs Alberti to be behind her. Alberti hasn't got many options here. I mean, at the outside chance, she could have swapped sides with her yeah, boat, yeah. maybe. But even that would have taken time. Oh, look and she puts her boat yeah. inside Lizzie. Lizzie's got all the time in the world yes, now. Yes, yes, she, yes. She had time to stop, wait, yes. readjust herself, and go there. She didn't see that herself, but that's. She's off. Yes, she's it's off and uh, yeah. Will she get caught there? I think she probably will. I think yeah. I think Alberti will catch yeah. her, but Alberti to overtake another story completely, mm. I think. Yeah, I think Alberti will catch her. She is. She looks uh, very, very strong on the water, Al Alberti. She made some mistakes there uh, into the portraits and also out from it. You are not to put uh, the bow or your boat on the inside of, of the fellow competitor. You're stuck there and it will take some decisive uh, seconds. In that situation, there's, there's Lizzie, 
Alberti's put a boat inside. Lizzie could sit there for a minute yes, yes. if she wanted to. Yes. Yeah? And and still there's nothing Alberti mm. can do. She just rendered herself powerless. Yes. It, it was... Uh, I doubt this was a clever move from Alberti going up on the outside. Uh, she has a little bit longer way now and the, could be a, disadva a disadvantage coming out of the last turn. It's going to be an interesting race to watch at some stage. The last turn uh, where um, Renate is heading for right now. She hasn't uh, put much effort into her paddling the last uh, lap. I she's getting slower and slower. Yeah, she? Slower she knows and she's slower. got that yeah, buffer. Yeah. She's just, so just paddling around. Yeah, the time gap will be about 40 seconds or so. She'll have a look across to see where the others are. She doubles back on them around this turn. There you go. She's just having a look at them now. She's looking at that gap. She's seeing a minute's gap. She's seeing less than a minute to the finish. And really nothing can go wrong for her now. Just paddling really very much under control. Very easy. Yes. It would be really nice if we could see the turn for the next two. Thank you, Mr. Cameraman. And yeah, maybe the turn is an opportunity for one of these to make a bit of a move. But it's going to be hard for either of them to get rid of the other. There it goes. So Lizzie. Lizzie's gone on the inside. She hasn't, hasn't broken a gap at all. Alberti's there. This is going to come down to the last 50, 50 meters for these two. And if you judge it from their speed at the start, maybe Lizzie has the slightly higher top speed. But I don't think either of these girls will want to rely on their top speed. They just need to keep the speed high enough so that yeah. overtaking becomes impossible. Lizzie's using her hips and the back a lot when she paddles technically better than Alberti yes. I'd say there yes. Alberti looks a little bit untidy very much bent arms in the water pulling with her arm rather than pushing down but coming to the finish any time now actually Renata's losing distance on these two yeah. second by second she's just the, the gap's going to come down to yeah. maybe 30 seconds in the end I don't for know for now she just have a nice little after yeah uh off the lunch paddle there with a smile on her face she did the damage she needed to do at that yes, portage yes. She, she created the gap of yeah. around a minute the, and now she's just using that minute spending it wisely the marvelous queen of marathon paddling once again her ninth gold medal in the european championships renate che from hungary another great victory impressive victory from this uh, this really, really great queen, the queen of all times in marathon paddling, Renate Che, Hungary. Absolutely phenomenal. And the, the race for second place is really hotting up. It's Lizzie on the inside. And she seems to have broken the Italian there. That's it. You often see that. The opposing paddler will move up, make their challenge. Challenge fails. And the gap opens back up. Lizzie safely taking second place there. Alberti settles for third. She did so, so well. She's happy with her third place, as she should be. Lizzie may be looking a little disappointed, but should be pleased with that. Really, it's second place, European Championships. It's a couple of months now to the World Championships. And there's, there's work to be done. She's seen that today. But she's not work shy, and I'm sure that work will be done. And I really hope to see her finish alongside Renata Che, maybe even in front of her. Let's, let's, let's push for that, shall we, at the next race, the World Championships. But uh, you have to say, Renata Che, absolutely the queen of all she surveys here in these races. There's no one close today. Those girls coming in, just to be checked over at this stage. Some will be pulled in for interview. Some will be called on to be tested, random drug testing. Usually they test one of the first three. And on screen we go back to the C1 now. They're coming into their last portage. Obviously crucial again. I hope we keep stating the obvious on that, don't we? 
but ap apologies for that but it, you, it can't be underestimated how crucial this last portage is you saw Lizzie she, that's where she broke Alberti on the last on the last one and then come the two C1s Cova seems to have had the best of it on the journey round he's still paddling strongly but how relaxed there is Mosquera he's still looking fairly calm reaching wide just to keep the steering going to keep his boat away from Cova's boat there Cova in theory should take him to the left side of the portage that will give him an extra second or two to get out and that's exactly what he is doing they're both well they both come to the right hand side it's very difficult no they both got opposite sides what a bit of comedy comedy commentary there opposite sides is Cova out first Mosquera second only a couple of seconds in it but you only need to come out of this portage half length up and that gap has seems to have opened on the run it looks like Cova all the way for me down onto the pontoon doesn't want to slip take it steady foot in back knee in and off he goes clean as you like Mosquera just getting in now foot knee and paddle off both right to the end of the pontoon so their first paddle can be off the end of the pontoon that's just routine for these guys and at some stage now we will get a uh, a shot of what happened exactly after that portage in the meantime we're looking at some of the tail enders there Stefan's gone off hopefully to interview the winners hopefully to get a hold of Renata pretty much a routine win for her today I imagine there's not a lot of excitement about that win for her. a bit of a, a bit of relief I would be I would think would be her biggest uh, emotion after that she's got to prepare now for the K2 tomorrow that's one of the benefits of these shorter races doubling up becomes a very practical option especially if you've got spare capacity there goes Kova he's made that break he's paddling very strongly there isn't he absolutely in charge of his race he's got a gap of some 15 20 seconds Mosquera giving up all hope of closing that gap he's just making the journey to the finish and while they go up there Barros probably a disappointing third for him third place itself may not be disappointing but the distance behind the leaders I'm sure that will be a disappointment to him he's just coming into the portage now his last portage stepping out of his boat in absolutely no rush to pick it up he's emptying it out draining it out draining the water out the back and sauntering up the ramp meanwhile Kova got the bit between his teeth one turn to go and the fun for him now the fun of the last run in I'm standing here with the silver away. medalist I suppose uh, quite happy silver medalist Lizzie Broughton yeah, uh, really tough race out there today, so I was pretty pleased to hang on for silver in the end. Um, pace was really high in the middle laps, so um, I suffered a bit, but um, yeah, no, happy with silver. Uh, you should be. How was your thinking uh, when Renata, Renata made her effort? Um, it was very fast. I knew I just kind of had to hang on for as long as I could. Um, I mean, I made it around a lap and then had a bit of a bad portage here where I slipped and fell in and she got away. So I kind of had to make the decision that I knew the Italian was just right behind me. So I just uh, held on for a couple of seconds, waited for her so I could recover over the next couple of laps, ready for the last lap, really. And you just uh, waited for the last lap. Did you uh, cooperate, you and Anna Alberti? Uh, yeah, I mean, she seemed pretty keen to do most of the work, which um, I was happy with. But yeah, yeah, we were, um, yeah, that was, it was pretty good. Yeah, good to work together. Congratulations, very well done. Thank you very much. Cheers. So I'm back on. I think we just had a break there while Stefan did a live interview with Lizzie Broughton. Hopefully that went well. And just in time to see Martin Kova come down the finishing straight, just picking off the tail enders in the K1 to uh, the world championships in Hungary and we will make uh, and coming to a finish line like that after the finish line just comes towards you on every stroke so next across the line in the women's K1 we Faye Lampf 
Had a good race out there today. She'll be racing in the K2 tomorrow and hopefully a better result for her. So it's gonna be Faye Lamp across the line now. And then following her will be Marton Kova just before Nuria Villachi. So there's Kova overtaking Villachi there just before the line. They're going to come in pretty much side by side by the looks of it. Another win for the Hungarians, two from two in this session. And Velaci finishing in, I think, sixth place. But uh, at some stage, I'm sure we'll have a screen graphic to confirm that. Next across the line will be David Mosquera. Gone around the whole race together with Kova in the front. He'd be pleased to have seen off Nuno Barros today. Certainly looks pleased with his result there. be a lot of local comp competition between uh, Mosquera and Barros, Portugal and Spain. I'm sure they've raced many times and he's notched up another victory there and all those victories count. Coming into the World Championships later this year, he's got that one in the bag. Barros knows he's been beaten and beaten well today. That all plays into the psychology later on in the year. So we come to the end of the second session today. Next up, just one race on the course for the afternoon session. That's the men's K1. The race obviously I've got a bit more personal interest in. It will be a big race. There's all the big names in there, the big players. There's experience in there. There's a couple of new guys come up from the under 23s. Balas Havas who romped away from the field last year in Oklahoma, paddled pretty much the whole race solo. Be interesting to see if he can step it up. I suspect the experience of the old guys will uh, pay dividends on that. It's very hard for the new boys to come in and make their mark straight away. Of the, the European Championships in C1 2015. Congratulations. Thank you. What was the toughest, uh, the hardest part of this race? The, I enjoyed the race. Everything went well. The hardest thing was the weather for me. It's very hot and, uh, and I, I can't bear the hat. But it was good, I win. But you did. And last year in the, when we had another interview in, in the US, in Oklahoma, it was also hot. But you mastered this race better. Yes, it was also hot and Singapore was the hottest. I enjoyed very much uh, Copenhagen. It was cold. <laughs> but you won anyway. Yes. Yeah. You were uh, pulling ahead uh, after three purchases, I think, but then you waited for the others uh, slightly. Why? Yes, because the water doesn't move because it's a lake. And on a lake, it's harder to pedal. And the weather is also hard, so I didn't want to pedal alone. Uh, did you uh, felt uh, sure of winning in uh, that early stage? Uh, after when Nuno went away from us, I felt, yes, that I, I can win it. Once again, congratulations here in Hungary in Gyor later on this year. Thank you. So we treated to a nice long shot of the venue again there. 
Again, I'm going to bore you with just how beautiful this place is. It's a fantastic place. Stefan's just coming back into the commentary box now, having done a couple of live interviews. Lizzie Broughton and Marton Kova. They weren't interviews I got to hear from the commentary box, so were the guys pleased with their races, Stefan? Absolutely, and Martin Carver said that uh, the greatest challenge uh, th today was the weather. He really didn't don't like uh, the heat. Um, and I asked him, it was very hot in Singapore and in uh, Oklahoma last year, and he was well off uh, also there. And he replied he loved the Copenhagen event. Oh, and okay. It was raining and cold, and, <laughs> and all others thought it was quite shitty. <laughs> Lisa was very, very, very pleased, of course. Uh, that's good. I, I'm pleased. Uh, there's, a, there's an option there to be disappointed after uh, mm. after she finished with Renata last year. So, so it's good to hear she's pleased with her race today. And uh, did she say that you know she hopes for better at the Worlds or? Yeah, of course, of course. Fantastic. Uh, she said uh, Renata was uh, really fast and it was hard to hang on, and she tried the best she could for for several laps, but then it was just nothing more to do. And yeah, if that. you get to the end of a race like that and you've given it your best shot mm -hmm. and you know you've given it your mm -hmm. best shot, then there is no room for disappointment, mm -hmm. is there? And uh, you can come out of it feeling good about yourself. Mm -hmm. You go into your next period of training feeling boosted and confident. Um, often, if you if you underperform in your own mind, mm. it's quite hard to pick yourself up yes. and, and get back to training. Renata did, uh, didn't want an interview as usual, but uh, <laughs> as usual, she promised me to be back at the Worlds this year, but also next year. So oh no way! We, we'll see her around. No, it, and do you think the other girls are pleased to hear that? Or <laughs> <laughs> I think they should because they are. Yeah. They are behind, but anyway, she's... Um, Each year she, she races, it gives them an opportunity to beat her. Yes, and um, and she means something to this sport. She is a real profile of the sport and uh, well-known all, all, all over the world. And we need that kind of, uh, of athletes as, as well. Especially coming into a world championships in Hungary. As there there uh, you have an educated, oh, yeah. educated spectator yes. base. They know what they're watching. They're, the spectators there will be measured not in tens as they are in mm. so many events, not even in hundreds, but you will have thousands yes. in, in Hungary. Yeah. They know what they're watching. Last she year. will be the poster girl exactly, for that event. Exactly. And, and it's great for the profile of the sport. Last year, last time we were there, it was 30,000 uh, spectators. Uh, it's unbeatable. And um, and um, uh, canoeing is the second sport of football in Hungary, and they they told me also their selection races races uh, will be uh, televised uh, wow. in Hungary. That's so, <laughs> where else in the world would in, that happen? In not in canoeing, maybe no. in South Africa. Yeah. They also yeah. have a good television coverage, but um, uh, it's like. Uh, <laughs> cross-country skiing in Norway or Sweden or bicycling in the, in the UK or something yeah. like that where uh, tele these events are televised. The, the last good race I did was in Hungary in 1999 and I was fortunate I, I fortunate enough to come into the finish line with the Hungarian his fan Salga so obviously the fans are rooting for Salga and my memory of that is that we're racing side by side for maybe 200 meters and the noise was so great that you couldn't hear the splash of your paddles in the water. <laughs> and it was like moving along it in space, in silence almost, despite the massive volume coming in at you from the spectators. And it, it's fantastic. It, it is. It lifts you, it lifts of the course. event. And you know, to have the race back there and sort of almost the spiritual home of canoeing is really a positive thing for the it sport. It is, it is. And to me, uh, this kind of event is very, very similar to what we experience in biathlon and cross-country skiing. And uh, up there in the Nordic countries and also in Germany, these events uh, gather um, 50,000 spectators and it's really great. Right. Uh, I visited the World Championships in cross-country skiing this year just to, to learn how to do this and all the te technologies. It appeared that they put in uh, 5 million euros just on the, on the timing systems and camera system so we try to keep up with that Maybe without money just the heart in it and, and uh, uh, the skill we can develop among uh, volunteers 
uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully we will yeah. be there uh, sometimes. The also, public, we the public, which I was up to this point, don't appreciate the amount of money it costs to cover exactly. these events this well. I mean, to you, were, I don't think you were talking to me at the time, but you were talking to someone else, and I was listening in, and the cost of putting on the TV and the sound and the the um, split times on screen it's measured in not tens of thousands but hundreds yes, of thousands yes, yes. and hundreds of thousands of pounds in an amateur sport where there is no income is a lot of money but if we do this well the incomes uh, will come because uh, we can use all this technology for good adv- advertisements and and they create uh, a popular sport already you see um, sponsorship coming into individual teams already yes. you see sponsors coming into individual athletes and it would be great if the sport itself could raise its profile enough that you got a, a big sponsor to do the whole the whole event. Exactly, exactly. And that's what what we are <laughs> heading for. So we're just looking there, head on shot of uh, Levanti Bala, Hungarian. Had such a great day yesterday. He was crossing the line exactly the same yesterday on his own, but in a slightly different position. Eh? His emotions will be very different today than yesterday. Which also shows that it's a different story to do with the seniors than under 23. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a tired man there. His weekend work is presumably done. I don't think he's in the C2 tomorrow. But uh, that's a man who looks spent. Yes. <laughs> very much so. He's... Uh, that's how it feels, I guess. Yeah, you know, if things haven't gone quite your way, things always feel a little bit worse. You start to feel the aches, the pains slightly more. And often you're more tired if you if you don't win. Yeah. Because if you win, you could, could dispose your strength uh, accordingly over over the distance. Uh, but if you don't, you, somewhere you have lost, and uh, uh, you lose just because you're too tired. Yeah, you've you've had to output yeah. to an extent that you're no longer capable of outputting, mm. and that's when you fall off the front mm. the front group. The more tail enders coming in. I can't quite see from this shot who that is, but around that area, I know we did have the uh, Croatian Lubeck could be him. We'll see as he comes across the line. Again, I think he'll be pleased to get this one over and done with. But still moving reasonably well. Five oh eight. Different Croatian. At least I got the nation right. It's the uh, that's Bruno Kumpes. He's come across the line. Looks very young. Imagine that's early days for him. Also, I think he also. will be around for a few more years to come. There it is. And 462, Belgian athlete, Steen Verlinden. Looks reasonably cheerful with her performance today. Probably doing one well of her first, her first international marathons. I certainly haven't seen her around before. No. 510 across the line now. Mirko Dar, Italy. <coughs> and it's going to be a while now until we get our next finisher, who is another of the, the C1s. And we start to build now, really, before the men's K1. I think so. I think so. Because uh, at 14.45, we will have a great race. Uh, the K1 men, they will be alone on the course. And they are 28 athletes. And many of them with a great, 